Okay, we're going to call the uh, regular meeting of the San Dimas City Council to order. Today's March 28th, uh, 2023. And um, the first thing we're going to do, you might notice Emmett Badar is not here, so as Mayor Pro Tem, I, I get to have this. And um, so the first thing we're going to do is have the flag salute. Please rise. Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, I think because we have a member missing, I, we need to do a roll call. Council, uh, Council Member Nakano. Present. Council Member Weber. Here. Council Member Vienna. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ebner. Here. Okay, uh, so. The record will reflect there is a quorum. All right. And again, Mayor Bedar is, is uh, absent today. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the City Council meeting, everybody here in the chambers, and there's a lot of you here, and everybody at home on. Uh, watching streaming or, or uh, on TV. Um, I'd like to mention um, we have an agenda packet and if those of you at home or anybody with a tablet or a phone on here can follow the agenda packet on the city's website. So if you wanted to find that, you can go to the San Dimas website, sandimasca.gov. If you just search for agendas and minutes, it'll take you to where the agenda packet is so you can follow along if you'd like. Um, Let's see, the first thing we have is a presentation from um, the California Department of Insurance. Do we have a representative? Okay. And can you uh, identify yourself for us? Yes, so I'm actually not Armine. My name is Andrea Valdez. I came to fill in for her. Um, I was actually excited when she asked me to do this one. This is my hometown. Grew up here, went to San Diego's High School. My parents are in the back, so they're really excited to be here tonight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they are thrilled. Riverside County is my area, but when she asked me to come do this, I was like, I'm going to come on back to my favorite place. So, again, my name is Andrea Valdez, and I work for the California Department of Insurance. I'm an outreach analyst. I'm very happy to be with you and your constituents to give an update on the work we've been doing on your behalf. Next slide. So I'm going to start by giving an overview of, overview of the California Department of Insurance and the role of the insurance commissioner. Currently, the insurance commissioner is Ricardo Lara, and under his direction, the department uses the authority to protect Californians from insurance rates that are excessive, inadequate, or unfairly discriminatory, make sure insurance companies have enough funds to pay claims, set standards for agents and broker licensing, perform market con conduct reviews of insurance companies, ensuring they are compliant and in good standing, resolve consumer complaints, and investigate and prosecute insurance fraud. The one thing we cannot do, however, is require or compel insurance companies to sell insurance to a particular person or community. And sorry, before I got excited about being here, this is safer from wildfires, our presentation. Next slide, please. So. California's devastating wildfires are a call to action. We are using every tool available to improve insurance for Californians. These last three years, after 10 of the most devastating wildfires in our state's history, we have prioritized meeting with wildfire survivors and Californians affected by the wildfires across the state. The commissioner had us get out of our offices and get out to meet with all of you. Throughout the time, we've met with more than 60,000 people and 58 counties to hear all about your concerns around availability and affordability of homeowners insurance because we needed to take it all in to consider it before we started looking for solutions. And of course, the very first thing we learn is that wildfires are not just a Northern California issue. It is a whole statewide issue. Next slide. Learning from you and our first responders, we tackled the immediate need. The commissioner started working with legislator on laws that help wildfire survivors, including increasing payouts and benefits, as well as increasing coverage for building code upgrades. If consumers were experiencing losses, they should receive the benefits they paid for with their coverage. 
We also implemented a law the Commissioner wrote while in the Senate giving temporary protection to more than 4 million residential policyholders in areas that the Governor declared a wildfire, wildfire emergency. This law gives one-year protection regardless whether or not you suffered a loss, helping to give people security and stabilize markets. Additionally, this is a big one, we increase the non-renewal notice to insurers give to you from 45 days to 75 days, allowing more time to find alternative insurance following a non-renewal. Next slide. We also uh, ordered improvements to the FAIR plan. As you know, the FAIR plan is the insurance of last resort. Um, what you may not know, though, is that the FAIR plan is not an, a state agency, nor is it a public entity. It is fire insurance pool comp, uh, comprised of all insurers doing business in California. The FAIR plan was established um, in August of 1968, and while Commissioner Lara took office, the FAIR plan's coverage limits had not been increased in decades. And so during this time, Commissioner Lara increased that as well. Um, he ordered increased coverage limits for both dwelling coverage and commercial properties, giving people twice the coverage they had before. Next slide. So it's Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara has directed insurance companies to provide discounts to consumers under the new Safer from Wildfires uh, framework for transparency about risk rating. The regulation requires insurance companies to submit new rates that recognize the benefit of safety measures, such as upgraded roofs and windows, defensible space, and community-wide programs such as FireWise and Fire Risk Reduction Community, designated developed by the state's Board of Forestry and Fire Protection, which currently includes the counties of Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, as well, and local districts. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is our Safer from Wildfires framework. So the first thing we have there, um, it is a three-step program. It begins with protecting the structure. This means giving you specific things you can do to ensure your roof, walls, vents, and windows are upgraded to be safer from wildfires. So just as an example, there is a Class A fire roof. Next slide. Number two is protecting your immediate surroundings, such as your backyard, um, deck, or other outbuildings. So cleared vegetation and debris from under decks. Next slide. And then finally, this is the big one, involving the entire community in the protection. That includes programs like FireWise, which brings neighbors together to protect their homes. So the biggest part of this, obviously, is the community-wide part. It's critical. By working together, we can do much more than we can do on our own to make our community safe with this new framework. There's nothing more frustrating than you doing all the work to ensure your home is safe, but still getting dropped because your neighbor's home is a fire hazard. So the big one here is that community work. Next slide. So insurance companies have until mid-April of 2023 to submit new rates for CDI approval. We're urging communities and homeowners to take advantage of this time to harden their homes and communities. So that's a big one. Um, we had the public hearing last April 13th, and they have until April of 2023 um, to submit their new rates. And then next slide. And we do know this is working because of the department's actions. We saw non-renewals fall by 10%, the latest, um, and that's the biggest drop in years. Next slide. So thank you for letting me be here today. I appreciate it. Any questions? Are there any questions from the council members? It's an important topic, that's for sure. Here in San Dimas, we have some fire zones and people mm -hmm. are affected by, by the insurance yeah. trouble yes. that they have, um, get, getting insurance and everything. So your, uh, your website is insurance.ca.gov? Yes. And there's an 800 number on there. Yes. So. Any questions? If a lot of people know about the California Department of Insurance. If you have any questions about health insurance, your auto insurance isn't calling you back. If you have any complaints, contact us. That's where we're here. We're here to help all of you. So that number is at 1-800-927-4357. Thank you very much, Ms. Valdez. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, our, our ne next item on the agenda is a proclamation um, for the DMV Donate Life Month. Do we have an ambassador or representative? Yes. Why don't you come forward? And I was wondering if you wanted to say a few words before I read the proclamation that we're going to... Uh, uh, how to about do. you read the proclamation first? I will do, it maybe it'll say everything you need to say. Let's... I, absolutely. Okay, I'll come down there in a second, but let me read it on the mic here. So uh, this is for uh, Department of Motor, Motor Vehicles Donate Life Month. Whereas the organ, eye, tissue, marrow, and blood donations are life-giving acts recognized worldwide as expressions of compassion to those in need, whereas more than 100,000 individuals nationwide 
and more than 20,000 in California are currently on the national organ transplant waiting list. And on average, 17 people die each day while waiting. Whereas the need for donated organs is especially urgent in Hispanic, Latino, and African American communities, whereas a single individual's donation of the heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, and small intestine can save up to eight lives, donation of tissue can save and heal the lives of up to 75 others. Whereas deceased organ donors saved more than 42,000 lives last year, the most ever. Whereas any person can register to be an organ, eye, and tissue donor, regardless of age or medical conditions. Whereas being a registered donor does not impact the quality of life saving medical care a person receives in an emergency. Whereas California residents can sign, sign up with the Donate Life California Donor Registry when applying for or renewing their driver's licenses or ID cards at the California DMV or at any time by visiting www.donatelifecalifornia.org. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Pro Tem John Ebener, Mayor Emmett G. Badar, Council Members Eric Nakano, Ryan A. Vienner, and Eric Weber hereby proclaim the month of April 2023 as DMV Donate Life Month in the city of San Dimas. And I'm gonna sign this. And I'll meet you down there. I'm not that tall. Well, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem Ebner, council members, members of the audience. My name is Cheryl Mahan, and I am a One Legacy ambassador, and I'm a living donor. <clears throat> the reason why uh, I want to thank you guys for proclaiming April as Donate My Life Month is my family has been touched by organ donation. I was first impacted by it as I saw my father struggle with a disease called polycystic kidney disease. Uh, we call it PKD for short, uh, but it's those three little initials have forever changed the makeup of my family for generations. My grandfather, my father, my brother, uh, the disease has now gone on to my nieces and nephews, and there's no cure for it. So when my brother said, oh my gosh, my kidneys are failing in 2009, I said, okay, I'll be, I will just get tested to be your living donor. And thankfully and gratefully, um, passed all the tests, got the best physical of my life for free, and um, was able to donate a kidney to my brother uh, to save his life. Um, now, my sister was in need of a life-saving organ, and my niece uh, became a living donor. My niece's kidney flew from UCLA to Wisconsin. My sister's kidney that she received flew from the Northeast to UCLA, uh, and on New Year's Day 2020, uh, she got her new lease of life. So, uh, it's very important to me, like I said. So, thank you to the city of San Dimas, and I'd like to just encourage everybody in the city of San Dimas, council members, audience members, um, please check yes to say organ donation at the DMV. If you aren't going to the DMV anytime soon, you can go to www.donatelifecalifornia.org. And another thing that we like to say is um, tell your family members. Tell your family members of your decision if you decide to become an organ donor and register. Uh, because when your family is faced with um, that decision, uh, we'd like it to be your decision that you've made um, by registering. So thank you to Mayor Pro Tem Ebner, the council members, Mayor Bader, who's not here, for declaring um, April DMV National Donate Life Month. Thank you. And, you, and uh, also, I've given you guys, we have a run walk coming up, and if anybody would like to uh, uh, bring their family and enjoy a, a day of celebration, uh, the One Legacy Run Walk brings donor families together whose loved ones have given the gift of life, uh, recipients, living donors like myself, and we all get together and we have a great time on April 29th this year celebrating life together. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right, uh, the next item on the uh, agenda is oral communications. Now, oral communications is a time when um, the City Council uh, invites and is glad to hear from the public on things that are, are, are of concern to you. Um, the way we do it here is we have oral commu communications at the start of the meeting and everything that is on the agenda you want to talk about at this time. So the couple things that are coming up about the mobile home park, senior conversion, and the SB9, if you want to talk about those or anything else, you talk about them now. Or if there's something that, you, that is not on the agenda you want to bring to our attention and just uh, want to tell us about, uh, now is the time to do that. You get three minutes to do that. There will be a little timer up on the, uh, the screen there. And um, under the provisions of the Brown Act, the City Council and staff is not really able to answer or talk about the things that you're, that you're telling us about. Um, they will be listening, though, and uh, the concerns can be uh, addressed later on. And, uh, and, and council members may be able to comment it when it's our turn at the very end of the meeting. So uh, I think I covered everything. The first thing we're going to ask about, it, were there any emails that came in? Because that's another way of communicating to us. Adam Mayor Portem, I did not receive any emails okay. on any of the subject. Thank you. And then secondly, um, some people might have filled out speaker cards, so we're going to start with that. If you didn't, at the end of that, you'll be able to speak if you decide to at that point. So, um, Madam City Clerk, uh, who's our first speaker? Uh, first speaker is Dr. Susan Beckenham. Okay. Just come on up to the microphone and uh, just tell us what you think. Hello. Um, thank you for giving us the time to speak today. Um, I'm kind of surprised that I'm the first one, but here we go. Um, I'm Dr. Susan Beckenham. I live in Cienega Valley Estates. I've been there for three and a half years. I am one of the very few who is still employed. That's an important thing to understand. I'm a high school teacher. I'm a high school teacher. So the idea of living in a 55 plus park is obviously something that was very good for me because when I come home, I have spent my day with the children of God. So it's nice to come home. I'd like to read you uh, a, a short excerpt from a letter that I wrote to the representative of the owner of Cienega Valley Estates. His name is Mr. Alan Alt. I am a resident of Cienega Valley Estates, and I am writing to you about the changes in the park. Let me begin by telling you how I came to be a resident. I bought my home three years ago. I was a recent widow, still working, and seeking a place where I could find community. From the beginning, I had some concerns with management and the way we as residents were treated, but I love my home and I love my neighbors. And so I chose to not take anything to heart and recognize that usually those that act out in that way come from a broken place. As a 42-year-old, 42-year high school veteran, I've been in the classroom for 42 years, hard because I'm 29, um, I understand and deal with these types of issues every single day. I've taken it all in stride and kept to myself and enjoyed the park. Then the last rent increase. It was $97 a month. My pay raise was certainly not $97 a month, significantly less. And my big concern is, I'm paraphrasing at the moment, my big concern is, what about those people who do not have a job? I understand that there's only 7% of us, it may be more now, but th at that time there was only 7% of us who were working. That means that the rest of my family, my San Diego Valley family, are on a fixed income. Then, the same day that the rent increase comes in, we get the letter saying, oh well, now we're going to convert to an all-age park. Absolutely horrendous customer service. We are treated on a day-to-day -day basis like scum. And then to do this to a group of people who have, don't be offended anybody, I call it God's waiting room because we go there to live out our lives. And unfortunately, I certainly will not be able to. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next speaker, Patricia Martin. Hello, my name is Patricia Martin and I reside at Cienega Valley Estates. I want to read a statement that I wrote. Let me start by thanking the mayor and the city council for putting the issue facing Cienega Valley Estates mobile homeowners on the agenda so that we, the residents, can share our concerns. The reason I turned to the city for help is because I read on your website, quote unquote, the city of San Dimas has long been committed to facilitating, expanding, and preserving housing opportunities that enable seniors to age in place, unquote. The question is not just how will changing a 55 plus mobile home park to an all ages mobile home park affect its residents. The question is how will it impact the entire city? Has any thought been given to the significant avoidable environmental damage that will occur with the addition of 1,200 or more people living in this confined space. Possibly 200 to 400 or more cars idling trying to get out of one of the two gates onto the heavily traveled Cienega Avenue between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. and back again at night. It is already dangerous to make a left hand turn out of the park, but with the added pressure of people trying to get to work on time and get their kids to school on time, it can only get worse. Traffic could be backed up throughout the park during these prime hours. The only way it could begin to be less dangerous is if a traffic signal was installed near the gate, and then they would probably have to remove our security gates. There would also be the matter of parents taking their children to school at the same time, or children walking to school and requiring crossing guards and other means to get them safely in and out of this community. Additionally, there's just not adequate parking to accommodate any increase in the number of cars in the park. With the no parking designations on Cienega and Lone Hill be changed, there must be a safety issue or why would it be designated no parking in the first place? Where are they going to place the multitudes of dumpsters that will be needed to accommodate up to 1,200 more people? There were recent issues with the sewers. Are the sewer lines even able to adapt to that many more people? How will our schools accommodate the influx of new students? There are four elementary schools within one mile of CVE. They have between 327 and 640 students per school. They are rated 2.5 stars to 4.25 stars. The schools with the least students rated highest. The schools with the most students rated lowest. What will the impact be on these schools if all 247 mobile homes have just two to three children in each one, or 500 to 750 new students for the schools to embrace? Will a new elementary school have to be built? If only half the children have to walk to school, how will they walk safely on Cienega, Lone Hill, and Arrow? Finally, there are currently no regular police patrols for this community. Will we begin having regular patrol officers within the gates because our population could go up by 65%? And with that increase in the population alone, criminal activity will probably increase exponentially. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Can I give a copy of this to someone? Yolanda Ogin. Good evening, Mayor Pro Term, Club City Council members and city leadership. My name is Yolanda Ogin and I thank you for affording me the opportunity to speak, to listen to me. Thank you to my CVE residents that are here and everything that they have said is correct. I just wanna share my feelings. My feelings are of disappointment. Um, it, extremely sad because of the change to um, an all-age community. I moved here, July will make two years that I have been here from LA. So you can imagine such a drastic change. This is a beautiful city, a beautiful community that I live in. It's peaceful, it's quiet, it's serene, and I love the residents there. Within the two years that I've been, the first year I was elected a social club president and HOA vice president. And I can tell you, we came in during COVID. We have done and worked so hard through the social club to bring activities and bring the people out. The community is coming alive again. These are people that are much older than me. And you know what COVID has done? It has just paralyzed even children. The people are coming out, they're living again, they're happy. And now that this has happened, 
you can see the change. You can see the change in the continents. And my goal as a social club president is to serve my community, to bring as much joy and happiness that I can to them. I don't know what the outcome will be, but I will continue to serve them as that is my responsibility. I hope that this will not happen. My hope is that we will remain 55 and over. Thank you for listening. Bill Beebe. Thank you very much. The Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members, the City Leaders. I'd like to read my statement concerning my wife's and my personal opinions regarding San Diego Valley Estates and its recent, recent moves to convert our senior park to that of all ages. I gave a copy to the uh, City Clerk to go on record. My wife and I purposely did not move into an all-age park because we wanted a quiet place to live out our remaining years, and hopefully it's a lot of remaining years in my case. We saw the CV, uh, CV, Sienna Valley Estates during our first visit, so the change is a disappointment. But I think the larger disappointment, however, concerns about how the process took place. We were noticed in writing of a meeting all according to protocol. The meeting start off, started off on a negative tone and it went downhill from there since it was conducted by, frankly, all the wrong people. The ownership failed to come. Now there's a large group here, as you can see, tonight frustrated by this change and perhaps even more frustrated because they believe their voices weren't heard during the notice meeting. Uh, I've worked many with many of you uh, in my position as senior commissioner, and I know that you're all decent people and respected public servants. Thank you in advance for hearing us out and for whatever you're in a position to do to mitigate the frustration and disappointment we all feel. My wife and I plan to remain at CVE and serve the community in whatever capacity we're able. My goal as president of the HOA in our chapter of GSMOL is to constantly strive for improvements in our community, top to bottom. Always leave something in a better condition than how you find it. We expect five-star service from the most well-groomed mobile home park in the city, and that's CVE is the most well-groomed. Always be respectful, even when voicing complaint or concern be a collaborative influence in our community. These are my objectives as we move forward. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Mr. Beebe. Larry Weaver. Good evening, my name is Larry Weaver. I'd like to thank the Mayor Pro Tem and Council members. I am today the representative of the ownership of the park and I'm here on their behalf. I'm an attorney, I've represented mobile home parks for 40 plus years. This is something we've done in, in many, many parks. One of the questions that comes up often, and I see I'm limited on time, is well, why would we do this? Why would we change? Well, there's some really good reasons for it. Frankly, it's better for business. It's better, in our opinion, that CVE be inclusive that we welcome everybody, that we don't restrict anybody. It's better to continue to offer a community that will be open to all residents of all ages, striving as we have for many years to maintain this as a premier community in the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, there are some distinct benefits that the residents should hopefully enjoy. Number one, despite what sometimes is mischaracterized. This change is very gradual. I've been involved in many conversions of communities. It doesn't happen overnight. In one case, this same owner, 20 some years later, has six children in their community. So it's not going to be something that we wake up tomorrow or the next day and all of a sudden there are 1,200 children in the community or 1,200 more residents. That won't happen. It likewise increases the pool of potential buyers when a resident goes to sell their home. Now, what's the benefit there? 
Well, if there are more potential buyers, there tend to be, and certainly I don't guarantee anything, I'm not a realtor, but I think most will agree that with a greater pool of buyers, there's a better potential for a good price, a good fair price. It also benefits the residents upon their passing and their heirs. An heir will now have the opportunity to not only inherit the home, but to potentially live in the home. They still would have to qualify, but they'd have the opportunity to live there. Now they don't have that opportunity. The decision to change is, is provided by the mobile home residency law, part of the civil code. My clients followed that exactly. They gave all the proper notice. They had the meeting. They gave more notice. And it can be effective in two ways. After that meeting was concluded and the, the additional notice was sent out, including the new rule, it can be effective immediately with the consent of the homeowner, or by law, it will take effect six months thereafter. But just as important, I'd like to point out some little fact somehow seems to be overlooked. Every homeowner in this community has a packet of residency documents, and one of those documents is part of the park rules and regulations, says specifically, owner reserves the right to amend at any future time for purposes. Oh, let, excuse me, uh, members of the audience, please be respectful. We'll give you 15 more seconds to wrap well, up. If I could just read this, it, it, it might um, take I, more, it's, it's short. But, I think we can't give you that much time. You, if you got 15, 20 seconds, go the ahead. Purposes of converting to an all age community, owner does not represent or promise that the community will always be, remain, or operate as housing for older persons. Okay. For, so that was something Thank that you. every one of Thank them Thank you very said. much for your comments, Mr. Thank Weaver. Thank you very much. John Strain. And, and as John makes his way up, yes, we. We're all just listening now, so please, no uh, comments from the audience as well, unless you uh, talk outside. Uh, thank, you for, uh, <clears throat> thank you for this opportunity to address you. I happen to work at Cal Poly Pomona, and my wife and I moved up here about back in 2017 so I could go to school here with the intent that we were going to move back to San Diego but we fell in love with San Dimas and the park we live in. The only problem is that, like you've already heard, that they're switching to an all-age park. Now, I can understand it's business, but in the comment that the attorney just made is that, um, you know, every time that someone sells or moves out, they keep getting paid. So it's not a chance that they don't get paid, the owners. There's no breaks on the rent. So even if you have someone who's buying or someone that's not buying, they always get paid the rent. Um, one of the things I ran into is that uh, sometimes the rules change, and we have no idea that the rules change until all of a sudden they pop up and they've changed in front of us. Um, but the only thing is that, you know, in a few more years, when I get done working at Cal Poly, um, my wife and I plan on moving. So I understand the, the bigger pool of, of people coming in and buying the houses. Um, that's understandable, but you know, we give up that, that livable, that senior community. You know, that's the thing that we moved in for. We moved here for the chance of having a nice, quiet community. Um, as the attorney said that, you know, um, he doesn't foresee us having a big turnover of kids right away. Okay, what if, we, what if we do? We have big wide streets, we got big playgrounds there. We got lots of kids coming in to play. You know, there, there goes our neighborhood. So one of the things I'd like to point out is that this is our neighborhood, this is what we moved there for, this is San Dimas, this is a retirement community. And to turn around and pull it out from underneath us. You know, they get paid every month, they get our, our rent checks every month, regardless if someone's living in that house or not. So, thank you very much for your time. Jeanette Witten.
Good evening. My name is Jeanette Witten, and I live at. Do, do you want to pull that microphone down just a little bit? Oh, hey, John. <laughs> <laughs> Blame John. How's that? Is that good? That's better. Thank okay. you. Thank you for listening to us tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, so many things to say. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it a little bit short. Everybody that has been up here so far, uh, ditto everything that they've said. In 1977, my mother and father moved from Michigan, moved into Cienega Valley Estates. It was a senior park at that time. Mom used to brag about, we're in a five-star senior living. We love it here. Can't wait, you know, for all you kids to move out to California. Years later, we moved out to California. Ten years ago, I moved into Cienega Valley Estates. My father is still there. He's going to be 100 years old this year in September. He lives three houses away. Never in my wildest dreams, I've been there about 10 years, did I ever think that this would not be a senior park. Yes, we do sign an agreement that says they can change it at any time, but after my folks living here since 1977 in this park, moving in 10 years ago, never thought that this would happen. Um, being at this age and having the security of living with people that are close to your age is you, you can't even, you can't imagine until you get to this point in your life um, that how important this is. Um, it's a great community. San Dimas is a great um, uh, town to live in. This is our home. This is our security. And uh, it's, it's just really a shame what's happening. I can't think of any more to say, um, but if anybody else wants to take my last minute, you're welcome to, to take it and uh, add to what you've already said. Thank you so much. Um, what's happening? Some people say it's not fair. A fair has nothing to do with, do with it. It's wrong. It's just 100% wrong. There's right and there's wrong, and this is wrong. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. George, George Oaks. Thank you very much. I live in Sienica Valley Estates. I moved there about five to six years ago. Uh, when I moved there, they promised me, they did, that this would always be a senior park. Five star. And I had a chance to look around before I moved there, and I looked at a lot of different parks, a lot of different cities. I moved from uh, Newport Beach area up here to be closer to my daughter who lives in San, uh, Chino Hills. And this is the closest place I could find that I thought that I would be happy at. Now, Sienica Valley Estates is a beautiful place. And I checked around San Dimas. And it's a great city to be in. I, before the, uh, we had the pandemic, uh, I was very active in the senior center here. Uh, went to play the games, attended the meetings, and since then I haven't been able to, but I fully intend to start up again. Being uh, a senior park, has been a, I've been able to really enjoy my time in San Dimas, and I want to thank the city council and everyone that's always been here for the city that they have, have devoted to seniors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Oaks, for your comments. <laughs> Kathy Amston. <coughs>
Good evening, Council. Um, as you all know, my bill has been in dispute over at Charter Oak Mobile Home Estates since January. I overpaid in January. I asked for a credit. I overpaid because the billing was wrong, but it was a new management company, so I wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt. Then in February, my bill went three times <laughs> higher than January. I brought it to the attention of the management company again. I have three bills for the month of February with three different amounts. I have two bills for the month of March with two different amounts. I got my March bill revised, and amazingly, they were able to bring it back in line with my four-year average, which I provided them the documentation for. I got my April bill today, and it's in line. But here's my concern. I got a letter from John DeFalco's billing company, and I quote from her letter. I am speculating that when you started using a different source of heat in your home to reduce your gas bill. I don't heat my house with gas. I heat my house with electric space heaters. So based on his billing company speculation, John DeFalco writes, it is our opinion that the gas did go through your house and that when you saw how high your bill was, you began to conserve. So in essence, they're calling me a liar. I don't appreciate it. I don't appreciate his intimidation tactics and his bullying. Then, to add insult to injury, they decided, since I haven't paid my bill since February, that they would take my $1,766.36 credit balance and apply it to the balance that they determined was accurate. That is unethical. John DeFalco has been in business, according to his testimony, 48 years. According to his own words, they had no billing documentation to go off of when they started working in the park. And yet, all of a sudden, he deems it's appropriate to just take his word against mine and take my money from me. This is unethical. As a city council, I know some of you are working hard to try and resolve this issue. This is four months in. This is not acceptable. You guys have got to jump on this and get it fixed. Either that or you need to get rid of John DeFalco's company and find another management company that knows how to manage a mobile home park because this is not fair to the residents. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Nicole Simeon. Hi, good evening, Councilman and my fellow residents. Um, I want to say I live in Cienega Valley Estates. My husband and I moved there about a year and a half ago. We decided to move there. My husband is a retired LA teacher, administrator for 38 years. We wanted to find a place where we can feel comfortable and fit into the norm of a retirement community where we would feel safe, comfortable, a beautiful place. Unfortunately, that has been ripped up from us without us having a say so. My concern is I've been in the medical field for 35 years. How is that going to affect our residents mentally, emotionally, physically? When we have residents who are ambulatory now, who can feel safe in our community, walking, conversing with our neighbors, that's all going to be taken away. We're going to have to deal with now with minor children, adults who have maybe no respect for our morals that we grew up with. Mr. Weaver, I'd like to address one question that you've never answered to any of us. How are we going to be protected? Where is our security? Where, how are we going to feel safe again? There is only one manager on the premises, two maintenance person. So if we have a 17-year-old gentleman playing loud music, we're going to call one manager, one manager for over 240 residents. Where is our security? Where is our um, ability to say, I feel safe? How is that going to happen? Nothing has been discussed about our safety, our privacy, our enjoyment. How is, all, how is all that going to be handled by only having one manager on site? And as I mentioned, the physical, mental, and emotional stress that this has put on our residents. 
We have a lot of residents that are ill, that are non-ambulatory, and all that's gonna change because now they're not gonna feel safe. How is that? That hasn't even been addressed. That's my biggest issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Nick McGee. Good evening, council and staff. My name is Nick McGee. I'm a resident of San Dimas, and I currently serve as treasurer for San Dimas Little League. I come here tonight in an effort to ensure your awareness of some of the safety issues that we have recently been experiencing at Marshawn Park. My sincere hope is that the city and league are able to work together to create an environment that is safe for use by all residents. As you may already know, since the scheduled closure of our actual dog park, there has been a considerable uptick in the amount of residents who are utilizing the baseball fields at Marshawn Park as a dog park. The natural enclosures of a baseball field make them a great replacement for a dog park and there's plenty of space to launch a tennis ball if you want to play fetch. With that increased usage, however, there's also been an increase in dangerous interactions between the league participants and the residents who are using the fields illegally by allowing their dogs to run around off leash. That is what brings me here tonight. On March 26, my six-year-old son was on one of the baseball fields waiting for me to bring our baseball equipment from the car for a workout. As I was walking near the bleachers on the third base side of the field, I noticed a man walking his dog off leash outside of the field and carrying a tennis ball towards the first base dugout. As I realized he was heading towards the gate to enter the field, I yelled towards him not to bring his dog on the field because we were having a baseball practice. He acknowledged what I said with an okay, then proceeded to throw the tennis ball across the field towards the third base coach's box where my six-year-old child was standing. Not surprisingly, the dog went tearing after the ball. You can imagine my fear as I saw an 80-pound dog that I'm not familiar with running full speed towards my six-year-old. It was terrifying and not knowing what that dog's intent was and maddening that an animal owner could be so reckless. That's not something that a parent should have to endure at a baseball field, a city park, or anywhere else. Alarmingly, this comes on the heels of a separate incident that occurred on March 12th at the exact same location. In that encounter, a German Shepherd who was also off-leash and running on the fields under owner supervision <coughs> aggressively charged at a board member and his six-year-old son when they opened up an access gate trying to enter the baseball field. Fearing for his child's safety, the board member shoved his child off the field, took a step back himself, and slammed the gate in the dog's face just before the dog reached them. When the dog crashed into the closed gate, the dog's owner had the audacity to scream and curse at the board member as if they were the one in the wrong for protecting themselves and their child. I encourage the city in the strongest possible terms to continue to expedite their work with the league in trying to find a solution to the ongoing and escalating issues. We don't need to wait for someone to get bit to see that there's a problem. Please do not let tragedy be our call to action. The board of directors at Sandy Dimas Little League stands ready and willing to work with the city however they see fit to address this issue. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you for your comments, Mr. McGee. May I approach him? Those are all the speaker cards. Okay, is there anybody else in the audience who wants to speak? I see a hand raised. I see a couple people. Just have a race to the microphone there. I think Margie's going to get there first. I walked fast. I just have a happy thing to talk about, two different events coming up. Uh, I'm Margie Green. I'm president for the San Dimas Historical Society at this time. And on the second Saturday of every month, we have a walking tour, a free walking tour of downtown historical, society, historical buildings. Uh, we would love to have you come by. The Historical Society will be open on the second Saturday from 10 in the morning to 1 in the afternoon. Come by, visit the Walker House up on the second floor. Uh, for the uh, walking tour, meet on the veranda at uh, 10 o'clock. It'll take you about an hour and 15 minutes. Then you can enjoy upstairs just as well. We have a museum. We can answer questions. We have a gift shop. We'd love to have people come up there and visit. We try to be part of the community and share our knowledge with you. And that's the second Saturday. Now, on the third Saturday, the city's going to be doing a cars and coffee in the parking lot behind B of A, behind O'Malley's, uh, really behind the Walker House. So we're going to be open at the Historical Society from 8.30 in the morning until noon, the third Saturday, to go along with cars and coffee. So please come on by and enjoy the second story. Uh, museum gift shop will be open then. We will not be doing the tour that day, but we'll certainly talk to you about the building and what we're doing for the city. and. Maybe you have some suggestions. So it's all free. I'd love for everybody to come by and visit us and make good use of that Walker House. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Green, for that valuable information.
Good evening, Council, Mayor Pro Temp. I am uh, live in uh, CV, Cienega Valley Estates. And uh, just reiterating what everybody else said, particularly the doctor here as a fellow educator. Uh, fortunately, I'm retired now, but <laughs> um, our concern, as my wife was bringing up, was just the health and safety and welfare of our, of our citizens. Very good people, very wonderful people that we have been enjoying for the past uh, little over a year and a half. And uh, with that being said, uh, having uh, been a teacher and having basically all grades, including uh, adult school, uh, I know what the doctor is saying about teenagers and about uh, just uh, overall uh, reckless behavior, so to speak. I was a dean of uh, students. I dealt with discipline for 14 years as well. And uh, I can see what's coming. And uh, it's very disheartening to uh, be able to uh, get that through my head that uh, there's 100% guarantee that something somewhere somehow is going to occur where one of our citizens in CVE is going to be um, affected by this. Not to mention the smaller ones and I know the smaller ones if you have them that have uh, been uh, um, they're uh, mischievous by nature and they're going to be running around doing things back and forth and uh, heaven forbid a car is coming down one of the streets there and somebody just darts out and uh, it, uh, I don't have to tell you what uh, the result could be of that but the safety is really a big concern and uh, not only that but maybe our seniors as uh, somebody mentioned they would be going out and um, um, walking, doing what they normally do, or doing what we do, and uh, having uh, somebody coming through, speed bumps and all, uh, just uh, plowing through and uh, not seeing somebody. So uh, that is my concern, and I'm speaking on behalf of all the other wonderful people that uh, I've gotten to know, that my wife and I have gotten to know, and really enjoyed. Uh, we've been San Dimas residents for quite a, quite a while now. We used to live up in Via Verde. And uh, we actually like CVE better. So we're hoping it stays a 55 and over community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Can we have another speaker? Thank you. My name's Dennis Haffel. I've uh, been living there for 10 and a half years at Sienica Valley Estates. And one of the things that I found hilarious was the gobbledygook about it's good for business. All the time that I've been there, there's been a waiting list to move in, okay? Everyone here has had kids. They're all in this park <laughs> for a reason. You want peace and quiet, okay? And okay, so you're gonna get six or seven kids in a year. That's like saying only 10 people died in Vietnam, but if you're the one whose kid died, you know, it's you. If someone moves next to me, I'm not worried about anybody else. Now I'm screwed, excuse the expression. And I like having the locked gate there. I drove petroleum tankers at night for many years, and uh, it's a whole nother world out there, the people, okay? A whole nother world. And if you all remember when you were 16, 14, 15, you're not gonna obey any rules. You're gonna flaunt them. You know, you're gonna make a lot of noise. I ride my bicycle all around the park every day, two, three times a day. Thank you for not hitting me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's gonna change. Uh, that's really gonna change. It's not even gonna be enjoyable. And I just don't understand how a certain group of people can work all their lives and we're just asking for peace and quiet. And this, this gobbledygook about money and business and everything, who cares? Go somewhere else. Because a lot of people are here because they've worked hard, they've run their race, and they want to be left alone. I want to be left alone. So, I don't know, that's about all I can say. I'm really pissed, but I'll just keep it civil. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else who wants to address the city council? So I don't see anybody uh, coming.
coming up. So we're going to, by the way, that, so there's a, an agenda item coming up. If you want to stick around to hear the city council discussion, uh, it'll be in a few minutes or a little while about that. Um, so we're going to move on to the consent calendar. Um, and if you're following along, this is page 15 on your agenda packet. Um, there are nine items on the consent calendar. They're all considered routine and will be enacted by one motion unless the city council member wants to remove something. Does anybody want to remove anything for discussion or further reports? I'll move approval though. We have a motion. I'll second that and uh, I'm going to abstain from item number six. Okay, Ryan. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, do we have to take a roll call vote or are we okay with? A roll call is not needed. Not needed, okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Um, it carries by a vote of four ayes, zero noes, and one absent, being, being the mayor. And the one abstention from me and on the, item number six. Yes, thank you, Ryan, for uh, saying that a second time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, that's the end of the consent calendar. We're now gonna move on to other business. We do have a couple items under other business. Ryan? Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I'd like to propose in light of uh, the interest in the community to take an item out of order, move item number two uh, to be considered now, and then uh, subsequently item number one afterwards. Is there any objection from the rest of the city council? None. Okay, then we're going to move to what is number two under other business, which is discussion and possible direction regarding conversion of Sienega Valley Mobile Estates home, Mobile Home Park from an all senior to an all age park. And this is way down there uh, on page 153. So I'm gonna turn it over to the city manager for, uh, for the report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In terms of uh, the request, at the last council meeting, uh, two council members, as per our policy, made a request to agendize the possible uh, direction to staff regarding a conversion of a senior only mobile home park, Sienega Valley, into an all age park. Uh, normally, the request that comes before you is just a simple one or two line. This is what was asked, and then the council would deliberate and determine whether they want some additional information or action to come forth. But we had completed some additional information prior to that request within the one hour limit. And I felt that it would be beneficial to provide that information in the staff report, articulating just some of the details that were available. Uh, what I've laid out were uh, some uh, an identification of a city that actually had taken an action to implement an overlay zone. That was the city of Antioch that restricted mobile home parks to uh, senior only by zoning. Um, also provided in the staff report is a uh, attachment to the mobile, uh, the MRL, the uh, the mobile home uh, regulations uh, that are administered by the, house, the Depart State Department of Housing and Urban Development that talks about fair housing and concerns about ensuring not to discriminate against families when it pertains to housing. And what I also outlined, uh, not knowing the direction of where the council was gonna go, uh, a number of areas, they're not all inclusive uh, for consideration um, in terms of drafting policy, deciding on what action to give the direction to, and it pertains to you know, legal implications of any action the city may take, some policy implications by the uh, virtue of the action, some economic impacts that could occur from that. And if the council of desire is to pursue any course of action, my strong recommendation is to request the city attorney to do an assessment as to whatever that direction may be so we can fully understand the parameters of what would be allowed by the city and what concerns or risks, pros and cons should be taken into account. And so with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor, to discuss uh, what direction you want to provide. We do have a, uh, a written report that um, Mr. Constantine provided are there any questions of Chris or we can go straight to comments? Anybody? I think it might be helpful, Chris, if you present um, some of the staff report for the benefit of the public. Absolutely. So what we have to understand that in the case, in this case, this mobile home park is actual private property. In 
in terms of this property, this is a private property that's zoned for mobile home. Um, it is in some ways the same as residential property that we have in the city. In other ways, it's different. Mobile home parks are overseen and uh, the regulations enforced by the Department of Housing and Community Development with very little regulations that are enforced, that are enforceable by the city. We can't repeat regulations at the city level that exist at the state level, so a lot of the uh, administration goes through the state. In terms of conversion from an all-senior park to an all-age park, it is strictly discretionary on the part of the owner. And there was concerns as I talked to residents about the city taking an action to allow Sienega Valley to make that conversion. The city took no action to allow any conversion. In fact, we don't have the authority to act to allow a conversion of that nature, and so therefore we never took any action. It was a decision that was discretionary on the property owner. It is a choice the property owner has, and in a lot of cases these choices are economic, um, policy, and other implications as to what is necessary for the ownership. Um, in discussing some of this with the owner, owner, ownership, uh, one of the areas, and I think it was identified by their attorney, uh, was a, it's a business decision. And so the discussion centered around back in 2008 and 2009 and the economic downturn, uh, demand for housing or demand for mobile home parks went down. And so when you look at a mobile home park that restricts the population that could access that mobile home park, in this case a senior park, there was lower demand in the area of seniors versus the areas of all age. And so for this ownership, there was significant impacts associated with the viability of mobile homes. And so therefore, this owner decided to start making conversions from senior to all age parks. Um, I raised a concern with the ownership about concerns that the goal was to just eliminate seniors from the park, and that was not the intention, that in fact, any conversion takes a very long period of time. However, we don't control the actions an owner would take. And so it really is about, uh, incumbent upon how they act in terms of any type of conversion. For us as a city, um, the history we've had has been very reticent to take an action to restrict a private individual's right over their property. And so some of the examples I use is we implement restrictions on single family homes. You know, if, if we try to act and implement that restriction, there's severe pushback about government intruding in the public's interest in a private matter of what I can do with my property. And that's something that the council has to weigh the value and rights of a private individual with the public benefit of taking an action that then restricts that private right that that individual has. And while today we talk about a mobile home park, that type of balance is the same balance that you would have across any private property, whether it be a single family home, multifamily business, commercial or industrial, that you grapple with any time there's a request that comes before the council. In terms of the legality, I, I know there is some case law, but I won't speak to that. That might be something that is analyzed if we decide to take further action about the balance between not discriminating against um, families in terms of the provision of housing. However, there is case law that supports you can't put restrictions for seniors only on mobile home parks. However, there is the countervailing balance that we've talked about that our community is a community or this region is a community where our children can't afford to live in the communities that they grew up in. And so you have parents that have homes in the community, the value of the homes have gone up tremendously, and the kids after going out to school, coming back and getting jobs, can't afford housing within the city. And so from the premise of analyzing a mobile home park, it is an affordable option for many in terms of the ownership's desire to make it an all, uh, all family or all age park. It is in furtherance of providing more affordable housing for families, but there is a compromise and a detriment to those that are seniors by reducing the potential for senior housing, which is also another concern and interest of the city that we have to weigh. In terms of the economic and rationale, we're very fortunate, fortunate in our community that we had voluntarily, voluntary agreement between owners and residents to implement a mobile home accord many years ago. That mobile home accord has provided effective rent control on properties that limits the increase that a property owner can put up on residents. It is a voluntary accord. And so in terms of analyzing the policy trade-offs, we also have to bear in mind that that mobile home accord expires in 2006. And to ensure that it's renewed or continues, 
uh, sorry, 2026, and to ensure it's continuous, we have to understand that if you take an action against a private ownership, it may increase the risk that private ownership will not agree, agree to continuing a mobile home accord, which in which case eliminates some of the protections that we currently have on our mobile home park. That is another consideration you have to weigh in any direction that you will provide. And while there's a few more details on there, I think that's a, a, a good summary of some of the issues that were raised in the staff report. Chris, how many of the mobile home parks, and I was looking through the accord, how many of them are 55 and over? I have to look to staff. I don't have the number. I, I know the majority of them have age restrictions of 55 and older. I don't think we have anything that's 65 and older. We have, I think, one that's an all-age park, but I, I would have to check the actual the, the split and the breakout. Our, our mobile home park is an age 55 or older park. And there was a comment from a member of the public that this park specifically has a waiting list uh, for seniors who are who would like to get in. I'm not. I don't have. I would refer that to the representative of the ownership. I don't have information about what waiting list they have. Is that? Can we do that? We can. I, I can't speak to our um, assets. We do have Monta Vista Senior Apartments, which does have a very significant waiting list. So, in terms of our community, there is a. There is a high demand for senior housing, and we see it with our properties, uh, but I can't speak to them. So I, I would defer that answer to their ownership. I, I think that, uh, well, we know, I think Lone Hill is an all-ages park, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the other four, we know two are senior, and I'm not sure about Mobile Land and, um, what's the other one? But the two over there on, on uh, Covina Boulevard. Um, uh, not Charter Oak, uh, the other one farther down uh, near the ed edge of the city. The two across the street from one another. But uh, any other questions of Chris right now? Chris, you had mentioned that uh, there could be state laws that make an overlay complicated. Uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how Antioch was able to do that, if if there are, did I misunderstand that? No. I. I, I, I the direction was we need to do the analysis to whatever direction we're going to take. Antioch implemented in 2019 an overlay. I'm not sure if there's been a challenge to that. They had implemented an urgency ordinance twice prior to that, but the 2019 was the actual formal implementation of a code change to make that restriction. And that's the only uh, case study that we know of in California that's done that? No, that's, that's one that I found within the limited time that I'm allowed to do research prior to sure. getting direction from council. So, so there may be additional cities we, we just don't know and then right. um, and just so the audience understands um, the council has not given direction to the city manager or anybody else to do a lot of research and so we're typically limited to an hour or so of staff time when it's something coming from a council member even a couple council members that's not in a meeting so tonight's meeting is to decide if we want to do something further um, so um, I, I had a couple questions, and Ryan, you asked one of them about how many are, are senior only. Um, and Eric DeCano, you asked about Antioch, so thank you. Um, you know, I think that's all the questions I the questions I had. Um, are there um, any discussion? Anybody wants I, to start? I had additional. So the Sandy Miss Mobile Home Accord. This is a voluntary agreement from and, and uh, between the park owners and the city. It, it is the park owners and the residents. The city was involved in negotiating that between both parties. I see. And what's the incentive for park owners to be a party of it? I mean, what, what, why would they want to limit voluntarily capping their their rates. I'm just trying to understand what the you know what the incentive was for that. For the potential of not implementing citywide rent control. I see. Got it. Okay. Right. That mobile home accord has other other things about pass throughs, certain things that they can actually mm -hmm. add to the rent. Um, and so it's it was hard uh, hard negotiations. So I've been on the council a long time and was involved in the original mobile home court accord. And to a point that Chris made about. Uh, zoning and uh, I don't know what you want to call it I wouldn't call it down zoning but whatever you want to call uh, protecting mobile home parks as I recall those properties at least some of them used to be zoned simply multifamily 
and there happened to be a mobile home park on it because they were formed in the 1960s or whenever. And the, the trouble was, or the fear, was that the property owners were going to go ahead and demolish the mobile home parks and just put regular multifamily in there. And this was a case where the city of San Dimas in the 1990s did step in, create a mobile home zone. We might have done an overlay first, but I think it ended up being a mobile home zone that these parks are now part of, so they, they can't be turned into something besides a mobile home park. So there, as Chris said, it's a balancing act between the private property rights of, it, of owners and then what we might feel as a, a different goal and, and, and a, a legal goal, if we, you know, it would have to be legal, obviously, to um, protect seniors in this case in the mobile home parks. And, and Mr. Mayor, you spoke about the negotiation of the accord. The last accord expired at the end of 2020 and reaching into 2021 when I first arrived. Um, the negotiations between the ownership and the property owners had stalled and potentially was going to fail. Uh, and we and that would have meant we would not have been renewing a mobile home accord and part of the issues for the ownership centered around the concerns about what can be passed through to residents as increases and there was concerns about if the county or the state passed through large tax increases that under the mobile home accord none of that could actually be passed on to residents and it's a concern from a business perspective to the ownerships and i, I can understand the concerns because you can't control what kind of bond measures with fees are passed down to you. And so we were able to convince the ownership and negotiate to have some level of provision, so some amount of pass-throughs, depending on the type of tax that may it may be, that are some of the normal and customary ones, yeah, that is predictable, yes, but some, something that's disproportionately large if it happens, to reopen the mobile home accord in the discussions. And so what it offered the ownership were, you're not locking yourself in for five years, with the risk that some large draconian increase would pass down and you can't share that cost with residents, you have the ability to reopen the accord to actually negotiate and figure out the best way to split that cost between residents and ownerships in a way that can minimize impact on residents but also minimize the impact it could have on the business viability for a mobile home park. And that was the linchpin that we were able to convince the ownership to sign on for another five years. I'm concerned, I'm a little concerned about now going forward, I mean, that was a hard fought one for the next five years. Any actions we take here do and most likely will have a bearing on ownership's desire to enter into another accord or if we do, the language that they may want to negotiate into the mobile home accord, which I can't predict now what ownership would be asking for. Mayor Pro Tem, I'd, I'd like to see if I could ask a couple questions of the owner, if you were uh, okay The with attorney, that. Mr. Weaver, I think we have a question from the council, if you'd like to come back to the microphone. Thank you for uh, indulging us for a couple minutes here. Um, one question is, is there a validity to that statement a member of the public made with regards to uh, a waiting list for seniors to get into the location? I'm advised there's no waiting list. Okay. And then as it relates to public safety, uh, in my experience um, professionally, uh, all age parks sometimes have predatory behavior as people who are younger or uh, otherwise a little bit more uh, or a different stage in life um, sometimes are problematic narcotics and other things that happen so uh, my question is has the owner given any thought to that uh, as they evaluate their business decision um, and if they haven't are they willing to consider that as is, is this decision final uh, or is this something that uh, is being pondered and we're, we're in that six month period at this point and we're doing it. Well, I, I think I can answer it maybe in a slightly different question or, or to a different it's question. It's not Jeopardy. The, the comments that I've, he I've heard are that, oh my gosh, they're going to ruin the park. They're going to destroy Mr. Weaver, I just, I just wanted to caution you. So Ryan's asking a, okay. a question and so this isn't a time to rebut. The no, other, no, I, the other I understand. No, no, not that's no, just just trying to make it. I specifically, I I don't know, but the the ownership is um, committed 
to maintaining the status of the park. It is a beautiful park. They have every intent that it will remain so. They continue to screen the folks that apply that come in and that are approved. They've just recently raised that one of the standards is a FICA score. That was just raised. So the people that will, will be moving in still have to qualify. They still have to comply with the rules. The park has gone a long way towards enforcing those rules. Nothing will change in, in that regard. So that's why I say it's a slightly different answer, but I don't see that there's going to be a great change in how the park is operated. So the, so then in, in more direct terms, I guess the answer is there, there hasn't been any consideration, I guess, at least as it relates to public safety uh, for the population, is that? To, to the extent that the rules include anything about public safety, re uh, residents are required to drive safely. Uh, that's one of the reasons why there are some speed bumps in the park. Uh, there is the, the front gate. It's not a, a, a safety, it's a privacy gate. We try to control the access to the park. None of that's going to change. Very good. And the last question. Uh, I guess it's just the most important question. Is there a pathway with the current ownership to keep the park 55 and older if the city was to work with the owner? I, I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for that. Thank you. Okay. So I do have a, a quick question for you while you're up there. Um, so, you know, as we frequently do, um, the, the city um, we, we kind of find ourselves sometimes as mediators and, uh, and for better or for worse, uh, th that's just kind of the nature of the beast here. Um, and in this instance, uh, it seems like that there's a disconnect between the, the owners of the park, um, and, and the residents. And so many times we look at these disagreements, uh, in a binary way, which is it stays 55 and older and it stays you know we're going all ages and then that's it um, do you know if there is a particular subset of uh, applicants that have applied to the park that are being excluded due to the 55 and older rule and do you uh, do you know if the owner um, would be amenable it would be able to uh, move forward with uh, operating the park and, and being successful because I don't think any of the residents want the park to fail because that would be bad for them too. But, um, you know, it, it it's something that can potentially be worked out between residents and the, the owner to, to potentially lower an age restriction but not necessarily make it an all-ages park and include who needs to be included to ensure the success long-term of the park. I won't say no. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that anything is open for discussion, but I, I can't tell you with certainty, yes. But, but there's some confusion, I think. As a 55 and over community, and the city manager may be able to confirm this, this park operates under a law that was, was passed and signed by then President Reagan in 1988. It was a fair housing law that at that time it did away with adult-only rental housing countrywide. Now, at the very last minute, carved out of that law was the senior only, 55 and over and 62 and over. And technically, we don't call it senior anymore. It's now uh, housing for older persons. But within that, within HR 1158, as a 55 and over community, they're entitled to rent to as many as 20% and still be a 55 and over community. That presents another whole set of issues that, that I'm not addressing tonight. But they could have always done that. They could have done this before without having to change the rules. This is, I think, a more fair way of doing that. But they could have always had 20% of their spaces occupied by persons that are not 55 and over. And to continue to try to maintain that 55 and over status, increasingly we're seeing more and more threats of litigation, more families, and I'm not necessarily speaking of this community, just in general, of families that are trying to get into parks, realtors and agents that are trying to sell homes in the community. I've seen cases where kids are hidden, literally for years, never allowed to go outside so that people can pretend that they're 55 and over and maintaining that status. So this park could have had many, many, many children already, 
and still be maintaining a 55 and over status. Um, they chose not to do that at the time. They could do that in the future. It is within the federal law. All right. Thank, thank you. I had a couple of questions for you. I wondered, I don't actually know very much about the owner. Could you tell me a little bit about the owner? Are they local? Uh, is it a person? Is it a company? Uh, well, do they own multiple parks? The, the ownership is Cienega Valley Estates, LLC. So uh, my understanding is Cienega Valley Estates, LLC, is the, it's a single entity for the ownership of the park. When I refer to ownership, there are other people and entities involved. My understanding is, yes, they do own other communities, including one which I spoke of earlier that was converted 20 some years ago and still after all that time still only has a handful of, of children living in the community. There are a lot of reasons why families won't want to move into this community because there, there aren't things for them. There aren't a lot of other kids. So I, I wouldn't expect and the experience that we've had is that they don't change fast, certainly not overnight. So is this, is, is the majority shareholder of the LLC, is it a person, is it a, a company, is it? That I'm not involved in, I don't know the answer to that. Who do you, who do you report to then, like when you I work with uh, Alan Alt, is an individual involved in the management and, and Cienega Valley Estates LLC. And my expertise is in the operations and the, the ongoings of running a mobile home park, representing the ownership of the mobile home park. Is Alan an owner? He is not, to my understanding. Okay. I remember Alan Alt and uh, from way back when, so I don't know if he used to own it or, or what, but, but he does, or the company does run a good park. I mean, I've, I've been there and it is a nice, nice park. They work very hard to maintain and run a good community and nothing will change. Any other questions for the, Mr. Weaver? All right. I, I had one more. So oh, I'm sorry. Just, this I'm sorry. is continuing on the line of, did the ownership at all change that prompted this, or was this the same ownership, same ratios, and everything else of the LLC? My understanding is it's the same ownership. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you all. Okay. I, I think we should uh, discuss any direction, some direction, if any, that we want to give staff. Anybody want to offer any suggestions? Well, I'll, um, one is I don't, I don't think it's productive to move forward in a adversarial way. And I hope that that's conveyed to the ownership and gratitude for many years of working with the city and these residents to be able to keep the park the way it has been. And I think it would not have prompted such an outcrying uh, if it wasn't something that was positive. And so um, I hope that my colleagues are in lockstep with at least the expression of gratitude to the owner for working with the city and the residents for many years to do something wonderful that has provided for generations uh, to, to live there and, and uh, God's waiting area, as somebody pointed out. Uh, so um, with that being said, uh, I'd really like to see if staff would work with the owner to find out more definitively if there is a path uh, or some compromise to be able to keep the park uh, 55 and older. Uh, and I, and I, I say that from a few different lenses, but I think um, reflecting on a conversation over the weekend with someone about this that, you know, in my profession, uh, working in law enforcement um, in a place that had all age mobile home parks, you know, I just I constantly go into calls for service, whether it's property stolen uh, or, you know, other types of things that become problematic and really negatively impact the, the quality of life of, of people living in, in that community, in those communities. I think that we, we heard tonight from members of the Charter Oak uh, Mobile Home Estates and you know, that's 55 and older and we got our own problems with that, you know? I mean, <laughs> this, this wasn't broke. I don't know why, why we had to do this right now um, with this particular one, but that would be my hope is that we could direct staff to to work with uh, the owner. I also um, 
I also would be interested in an, in in a uh, it, it wouldn't be worth that if there wasn't some prudence behind it either. So I'd be curious uh, about the legal uh, beagle uh, side of this um, as it relates to that. Um, I'm the first one not to be a fan of uh, in government overreach and all that other stuff. But I also think that there are things worth fighting for. And, uh, and you know, as many know, my, my parents are elderly. And, um, you know, you think about all of those things when, when you talk about stuff like this. So we've always been a senior-friendly community. I think we should continue to be. And uh, I, hope, I hope we do that. So. Uh, thank you, Ryan. I, uh, if, if I could just mention, there's a couple of different things. When this issue first came up, uh, the first thing that came to my head was um, my grandfather, uh, for a very long time, he's, he's passed away, he's been gone for, yeah, shoot, almost 10 years now. But uh, for a very, very long time, I spent a lot of time at his house, which was in this park. And uh, he, he spent... 20 plus years there and uh, you know we spent a lot of family holidays there and we we visited quite frequently and I will say that it is a special kind of park it is uh, it is a st uh, step above uh, many of the other the parks that I have visited and it's uh, it's very evident that the residents care about this uh, park and that the the ownership also cares about this park so uh, I, I too would hope that uh, this is something that that uh, can both parties can be brought to the table because we have we have two stakeholders here, an uh, uh, ownership stakeholder and a uh, you know a resident stakeholder and and both are equally important to me. Uh, I too am very hesitant to as a you know governing uh, as, as the government um, telling private owners what they can and can't do with their property, but. I will say that uh, that there are times in which that becomes uh, a viable option for us as the government, right? And uh, and I think the distinction uh, is that the mobile home parks are a unique situation because you have uh, homeowners who own a a um, a home that they're renting from the owner. And moving that home is most of the time not an option. Uh, the, the costs of that are, are incredibly high. And nowadays, the number of parks that you could move one to are, uh, are getting smaller and smaller because the parks are getting torn down and, and housing is getting built on top of them. So I think mobile home parks in and of themselves are a special kind of case that require a little bit more uh, care and attention on the part of us as the government. Um, I too, being in law enforcement uh, and working in a city right next door within a stone's throw, um, have worked very closely in in all age uh, parks. And it, to be honest with you, scared me a little bit when I heard that this uh, was a consideration is converting the the park into an all age park because I have also had. Uh, overwhelmingly negative uh, experiences at work when I was dealing with all age parks. And, and that's coming from a city, again, stone's throw away. So we're talking the same area, the same uh, demographic, and uh, it, nothing says that, uh, that that will happen here. But I, I think logic would, would indicate to me that that's a distinct possibility that some of those same issues may carry over to an all-age park in our city. Um, and, uh, and you know, the, the interesting part, just from my um, observations while I was working uh, in that city, was that the, the senior-only parks, the 55 and over parks, uh, we significantly uh, responded to significant, significantly less and, and dealt with far fewer incidents uh, in those parks. Um, it, and that's clearly just based on my experience only. I don't have statistics to back that up. Uh, I mean, I was able to, to figure out that Lone Hill Manor was the, uh, it seems like, the one all-age park that's in our community, and all the others seem to be 55 plus. I was doing some Googling while people were talking. I promise I was listening, but I was also doing some research too. But um, Appreciate it. <laughs> so um, that, that would be 
uh, my, Ryan's thought on this, I think, is reasonable, um, and I would be supportive of that as well. Um, I, I would just say that um, I definitely hear the residents. Uh, I, I, I sympathize with the, the ownership, uh, but, but I do think that this may be worth taking a look at, including uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of um, uh, calls for service our sheriff's department are getting at all of the different uh, mobile home parks, maybe break down some data on that and see whether our all-age parks are experiencing higher call volumes oh, and types of crime. Thank you, uh, Council Member Weber. Council Member Nakano. I think they're applauding your research. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, too, support Councilman Vienna's request to look to see if we can resolve this amicably and if there is a path forward. Uh, but barring that, I do have questions that I think the Council should uh, have examined if we do need to make some tough decisions. Uh, everyone else talked about the what's at stake here. It's a very complicated issue. We're talking about intervening in a community to keep it the same against the property rights of an owner. And the implications of this would not extend, it would not just be limited to the park. It would have citywide complications, implications that we need to think about, right? There's always some adverse reactions that could happen. And I think that those are things that we should explore and talk about as we weigh the equities, not of just this, but of other stakeholders we have not identified yet that may be impacted by this decision. So as we think about this, um, the crime aspect is worth looking at. We have a great model here, Lone Hill Manor. It would be interesting to see, is crime, are issues higher there than the other parks? Uh, that would be something to consider. Uh, another implication is what does this do to uh, potential investment within the city? Uh, knowing that if we were to get involved, would this turn off other developers, other types of private businesses who may want to come in and see that council may change things that could be that could have an impact on their um, on their forecasts and the rest? Uh, it, it would be good to understand uh, Antioch a little bit more to see how this impacted them when their policy went into place um, and whether there are any legal challenges or any other cities that had faced that. Uh, and that goes into my final thing, uh, final issues. I think we do need to look at the legal implications of this. If we were to make any kind of a change, would this open up the city to lawsuit other legal matters that could be very expensive that would um, you know, that we have to factor in in terms of our own budgeting and, and process of that sort. Uh, so my hope is is that the uh, we're able to find a path forward, and that's why I asked all those questions about the owner. Is this a change in ownership? Is this a corporation? Is this a person who's willing to sit down and listen and talk? Uh, because I do think that this issue, uh, it touches people's homes. It touches people's public safety. It touches people's neighborhoods. It touches on the promise of what they thought they were buying into when they moved here. And so those things have to be considered and weighed, and I hope it's more than just the bottom line that uh, is up for discussion. So with that, those are the questions that I have, and uh, happy to pass those on and you know offline if you weren't able to catch everything, uh, yeah. but hopeful that we have a good outcome uh, from this that doesn't require us to go down that path of intervening in this way. Uh, I'm hearing a majority of the council giving direction uh, I, I do have a meeting with the principal next Thursday already. And so I can have the discussions and look and see if there's a pathway that could be negotiated. But I will caution that if there is a pathway, that pathway and the requirements to get there may expand and be br much broader than just a focus on can you keep this in all each park. It may have implications on the mobile home accord or may have implications on other elements of code that would be n required to change to facilitate a potential pass. So I, I just caution that in mm -hmm. terms yeah. of what could come I, I am curious as well, now that you mentioned the Mobile Home Accord, is if the decision to uh, expand the, the park to an all-age park may be driven in part due to the Mobile Home Accord, if the, the owner is prohibited by the terms of the Mobile Home Accord from increasing space rent in order to make the uh, park uh, long-term sustainable and they have to potentially that that may be part of the reasoning why they're they're looking to expand to an all-age park to 
provide the extra income that they're not getting due to the mobile home accord. And, and you know, at that point, uh, just to, to throw it out there for the, the, the public, you know, there's, there's a tipping point there. Um, like I said, I believe that everybody in this wants the, the park to succeed because I think it's in everybody's best interest. But, you know, at a certain point, if, if, we're, if we're very serious and we're, we want to protect the park and keep it exactly as, as we know and love it now, um, there may be, that may be the, the pathway forward um, uh, from from the the ownership in order to ensure the continued success and that you guys can can continue to to enjoy that park is to um, revisit terms of the mobile home accord and maybe maybe that's the the discussion that needs to be had but you know it, who knows exactly what the problem is until we do some some uh, exploratory surgery hopefully not too painful but uh, uh, you know it, it's sometimes there there is that that uh that growth well inflation sometimes inflation just needs to happen in order for us to continue to enjoy the same things that we uh that we know and love and and at some point uh it may be worth it and at some point it may not be worth it but that's uh you know something that i think we're going to have to uncover as we yeah. move forward and look at this I, I would echo what Eric, uh, what Councilman Weber said that uh, residents, staff, the owner, and the city council should all know what options are on the table and what the consequences of those options may be. And by arriving at whatever decision we end up at, it's done in a holistic way and in a transparent way. Uh, so that way we, we did look at this issue seriously and deeply. Uh, so I, I do understand that this could open up a can of worms, but a can of worms, so be it. Let's see what, what's there, and then we will we'll, we'll make our recommendation. It seems like the council does want some more staff work on this and some more legal work done on this. I'll just uh, make, make a couple comments. One is that... Uh, I really appreciate our city manager, Mr. Constantine, for proactively scheduling a meeting with the owner to talk about the issues. And so, and with the benefit of council's uh, thoughts, he can go into that meeting. Uh, knowing that the council's preference, it sounds like, is that the park remain 55 plus, if at all possible. And it kind of sounds like we'd like to get to that point. Um, having said that, I'm, I'm going to just make uh, actually one comment because everybody else has made uh, great comments about public safety, safety, uh, property rights, how, what effects it might have on the mobile home accord, other investments, and that kind of thing. And that's just about the affordable housing component. The council is acutely aware of the affordable housing crisis that we have, and we talk about this all the time. Um, we need to protect affordable housing. We need to protect affordable housing for families. So families uh, that have small kids and, and of all ages, uh, it is important that we do what we can to have affordable housing for families. That being said, converting the, senior, the, the mobile home park from senior to all ages is perhaps a way of providing more affordable housing to families but you have to think about what is happening on the other side, which is that the affordable housing for senior citizens is being diminished. And so we have a goal, of course, of affordable housing, and it's tough to do in Los Angeles County, period. But we do have to look at both sides of it. Um, I'm really interested in what Antioch and perhaps other cities have done and see what the legal ramifications of that, that is. I mean, is, is there a challenge in Antioch already or, or what, what's happening up, up, up there? Um, and perhaps there are other California cities that we, we don't know about um, one way or the other. So in addition to working with the owners, um, I'd like at least some exploratory work done on, um, on how that ordinance works, you know, because it's not included in our packet. I have not read it to see exactly what the provisions of that are um, to protect senior parks in, um, in Antioch. Uh, well, I just, let me just follow up because we're, 
we're expanding and there's a lot of tentacles happening. So right, it's it's, it's a little bit more than what you asked for. Yeah. So I am not in favor. Just for the record, I am not in favor of proceeding down an ordinance path or anything else on exploring or whatever we're going to do if the owner is willing to work with the city and the residents i think that the city's involvement in this and and to the point that you raised in in looking at the staff report um i fear the mobile home accord becomes in jeopardy if we go down a path too far with this and i think council member weber's points are valid that you know there is a balancing act with this and if the owner understands the significance of this to the city not just with their property but to the other mobile home parks as what those protections provide to the seniors and those people in our community then i hope there would be some compassion uh, in that and understanding and some resolution in which case I don't see a need for the city to get any further involved. But in the event that they snub their nose or whatever the case may be, then so be it. We, uh, you know, I don't think we should not do our homework. I think we should get the legal analysis done and all of that stuff. But nobody wins going into a, uh, a gunfight with their, both their guns drawn at the same time. That's insane. So you know, I do think some opportunity you know, in some some good faith because of a long-standing relationship will go a long way before we go and get an arsenal together. Right. I, I wasn't uh, talking about the arsenal. I, w I wasn't even talking about going into the gun shop and looking at things. <laughs> uh, I, I was just, uh, it's just uh, getting a little bit more information about what what that option was. Now, if, Chris, you feel that in talking with the owners it's better not to do any of that for a couple of weeks for a month whatever they you know, whatever your, your feelings are whatever feeling you get from that i think that would be in line with what everybody's saying um but i i you know you made some statements in the report about the legalities the risks and that kind of thing and that's where i was just wondering a little bit more about that. I, how does the council feel about just getting a l little bit of legal opinion on it, or do you want to wait on that? I'd rather wait until we need to do that, if we need to do it. I mean, there's going to be staff time expended on Jeff's side to do that, which is a cost to the city if we need it. If we don't need to do it, I assume not do it. Would be my preference. And frankly, if we have to do it, that'll probably end up being a closed session potential litigation item, to be candid. So... <laughs> Yeah, I was actually thinking of along that same line that there there is that mm -hmm. that tightrope to walk here. And Mr. Nakano, you had asked some questions. Did any of them involve uh, the, legal the legal questions? Although I do think that um, Councilman Vienna's point is fair that perhaps we shouldn't expend that type of time until it's necessary. Um, although I do think that as part of the discussion, we should absolutely know what the legal implications of something like that are uh, as it factors into our decision but i do think he is a wise steward of the budget in that regard and i support that all right so my understanding of the direction then is that we'll uh headed by chris or chris will uh, talk to the owners of sienega valley estates uh get a feeling if there's a way of uh of get, get a feeling of what uh they're what they think and then are you going to come back with, to us with a uh, report on that at our next meeting or, or so, so in or case. meet us in the armory? Uh, I, I have a feeling that the owner when seeing this council meeting will be very well instructed in kind of where the, the council could potentially go. And so I'll have the conversation and see if there is a pathway forward. Um, I'll take the lead on that. Um, obviously there's a time sensitivity given yes. that notice has already been provided and the six month clock has started. And to the extent I need community development help, I'll receive that and we will bump other priorities uh, in both departments to ensure that we can actually accommodate that. Um, in terms of the legal analysis, my understanding is don't, don't pursue it just yet. Let's first understand, is there a win-win partnership that we can move together on this and then come back to council and advise us. 
And when I do that, I'll include the, I'll just include the Antioch ordinance. I want no, no, no analysis, so at least you can see what they actually did, and then we'll right. leave it at that. Is that does that sound reasonable? I think if you get the impression that the city's going to have to take more action, then I would support the legal analysis when you bring it back. It give you the discretion to do it if council wasn't opposed for the purposes of bringing the context of it if it's relevant to the city's next steps. But Therefore, we don't need to do it. But if you seem like you're getting traction and it's not necessary, then let's I, not do I it. I just want to make clear because there's some countervailing interest in that. And so I will work with the owner. But if it appears that, no, this is the direction I need to go for business reasons or really isn't a pathway, I just need to know from the council, are you giving the direction to start bringing forth the framework that could potentially lead to direction to put in a place an ordinance or some other manner? I don't know. I don't think uh, the framework may not be the right word. So this is a case of just understanding. So, so maybe there may be members of the council who want to move forward with a framework, but it, it's understanding since this just came up re very recently. It's understanding w what is another city doing, and is it legal of what they're doing? But but we're not doing that right now. That's if you get the feeling that the owner's on a path to all ages and he's he or she or they do not want to uh, they're, they're, they're not amenable to discussion if I may I think the easiest is to just work with the owner Chris and see is there a pathway and then report back and then get direction for council what additional work because if, I think if we interla interlace the two you're effectively saying we're going to proceed potentially down some forced governmental intervention, in which case there's really no reason to say, you decide if you want to do that, Chris. That's a great point. That's that's fine. Will you be reporting back at next meeting or just in a memo or what are you going to do? I, I will do as ex expeditiously as possible. Let me, let me see. Uh, as other negotiations that we currently are involved in, they don't necessarily take a week to resolve. And so I, I need to see, is there a pathway and what other tentacles it has to get there? And if I may need to come back and get advice from council on those other tentacles before some final okay. determination. All right. Okay. If the direction's clear, then that is the end of that agenda item. Uh, do we want to take a five minute break? Does anybody need one? Yeah, I can use one. Let's take a five minute. Uh, let's, we always say five minutes and it's 10. So let's take a 10 minute break and actually adhere to the 10 minutes. How's that sound? 10 minute break, make it five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
The uh, social hour is ending. It's going to wait just another moment. All right, we're going to reconvene the city council meeting and we're going back to um, the first other business item it's on page uh, 121. This is a consideration and discussion on zoning, design, and development standards that the city could include in an ordinance to minimize negative impacts related to Senate Bill 9, which requires cities to ministerially approve subdivisions of single-family zone parcels, the subdivisions, the par divide the parcels into two parcels, and develop two houses on each parcel. So Chris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will turn it over to Louis Dorico, our planning manager for community development. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and members of the city council. Again, before you this evening is some options that we can, could consider in, including into an SB9 ordinance. Um, we've I've had this item before you um, before, um, just want to provide a little bit of background. So SB9 was signed into law September of 2021 and went into effect January of 2022 and essentially requires cities to ministerially approve urban lot splits and two unit residential developments. Um, so essentially what this creates is one single family uh, residential zone parcel could end up with four units on the property if they chose to develop um, per SB9. Um, there are some minimum standards that the law has outlined and those uh, minimum lot size would be 1200 square feet and the minimum square, uh, units would be 800 square feet. Just continuing on background, uh, January of 25, uh, January 25th, uh, 2022, the City Council did initiate the Code Amendment. Um, uh, that Code Amendment would, was gonna include some objective standards and also potentially some development incentives. Uh, those options were presented to the Planning Commission June 16th of 2022. Um, they provided the recommendations to the City Council um, July 26th of last year, we came before the council and presented those options. Um, the council directed staff to bring back uh, three options and explore additional uh, in incentives as well. Uh, the three options they wanted us to look at was to provide uh, options ranging from the least restrictive to the most restrictive. And just to kind of refresh remembering what um, SB9 consists of, SB9 consists of two aspects. One is it can do lot splits. The second one is uh, uh, de develop uh, units on the property. So the first aspect, it's an urban lot split. There is a minimum qualifying criteria, which is on your screen here, that include um, uh, such as parcel must be zoned single family use, um, the lot size, minimum lot size is 400 square feet and at least 40% of the original lot. Uh, parcel can have been previously subdivided pursuant to SB9. So these are some of the minimum qualifying criteria that a property would have to meet in order to uh, be processed as a lot split under SB9. There's also minimum development standards um, for lots uh, that are created through SB9. You can only have two units per the newly created lot. Uh, ADUs and junior ADUs are counted towards that maximum number of units. Um, we cannot require dedications or offsite improvements. And under this scenario, if they're going to do a lot split, the owner uh, needs to um, sign an affidavit that they intend to occupy one of the units for at least three years. The other aspect is the two unit development. So under this uh, minimum qualifying criteria, again, similar to the other aspect, the parcel must be zoned for single family use. Uh, project cannot require demolition of more of 25% of exterior walls unless allowed by a local ordinance or site has not been 
occupied by a tenant in the last three years. Um, parcel cannot be deemed historic or located in a historic district and must not require demolition or alteration of protected affordable housing or housing that has been occupied by a tenant in the last three years. The minimum development standards for a two unit development, um, again, they do set number of maximum number of units. If um, a lot is created through SB9, it's a maximum of two units. If someone was just wanted to take advantage of the development uh, uh, incentives under SB9, they can create four units on their property. It would consist of two units, an ADU, and a junior ADU. Um, there are minimum uh, setbacks, which consist of four feet uh, for the side and the rear. Uh, no setback requirements for structures constructed in the same location and to the same dimensions. And a maximum of one parking space can be required for these units. However, if a parcel is located within half a mile of a high-quality transit corridor or a major transit stop, like the Go Line station, then they're exempt from parking. These are just some scenarios for unit developments. Again, they can build up to four units per property. They can have two units, which is one, the primary unit and the second unit. Uh, NADU or junior ADU, um, in up to four units, they can have uh, one unit, a secondary unit, an ADU, and then a junior ADU within one of the two units. And these are lot split scenarios. So again, um, if they pursue this route, the newly created lots, you could only have a maximum of two units on the property. Uh, so it would be one, the primary unit, and the second would either be the second unit, an ADU or junior ADU. And on your screen, it's just some different scenarios of how these lots can be configured. So those some options were presented to the council. And, and the initial intent uh, when staff ha had began this discussion was to draft an ordinance that would minimize any impacts to existing single family neighborhoods. That was a big scare that uh, SB9 was going to destroy single family neighborhoods. So you know, we, we took the approach of um, uh, drafting some proposed options that would limit um, unit size, height, and parking restrictions to kind of um, uh, restrict these developments and, and kind of discourage them from happening in the city. Um, those options were presented to the council and the commission. Um, since we last came to the council, um, staff has been exploring additional options, options um, as requested by the council and, uh, and see what other incentives we can provide. And more importantly, we've also been tracking ACD's website uh, to see if they would release any updates or clarifications to the law because there was a lot of ambiguity related to the law. Um, while they have not released any updates or to the law, um, staff has been made aware that um, HCD has been um, coming down in certain cities. We, un we know that two cities in the San Gabriel Valley received letters essentially informing them that they were in violation of the SB9 law and Houses Housing Crisis Act law. Essentially what those cities uh, adopted, they adopted an ordinance that was more restrictive than their existing single family standards. Therefore, HCD saw that, saw that as a violation of the law and sent them letters, and as a result, those cities are currently amending their ordinance. Therefore, the options that staff had presented before, the limitations, we our initial intent was to apply those limitations to both units. However, um, given those letters sent by HCD, and after having conversations with our city attorney's office, uh, you know, we uh, change our approach. Um, so after having these discussions with the city attorney's office, they recommended that we propose an ordinance that the first unit be allowed to be developed per our existing standards and only apply limitations should the council de decide to, to the second unit. Taking that approach, um, it would be hard to argue that uh, for HCD to say that we are creating an ordinance that's more restrictive because we would allow one unit to be developed per our standards, which is currently allowed right now. Um, those limitations would only be applied to the second unit should the council decide to. In addition to that, we've also been keeping track of um, SB9 activity, not just for uh, San Dimas, but also adjacent cities. And just to let you know where we're at, this law went into effect January 1st of last year, and we've only had five applications submitted. And of those five applications, one of them, they actually processed it under the normal procedures, but they switched it to an SB9 project so they would get out of doing offsite improvements. So technically, we've gone five, but only four under SB9, and those are still being processed. And we've also reached out to adjacent cities, and they've also seen limited activity on SB9. So the fear that we had that this was going to uh, create disruption within single-family neighborhoods, it hasn't happened yet. I think it's too early to fully understand why the lack of activity, but 
we believe that it's it's a lot of times it's not physically feasible and sometimes financially feasible to do these lots because most of the times it requires that the existing house be demoed um, under our current law ordinance um, someone could just go and build an adu without having to go through this restriction so um, that may be the case um, and also it's we know for send uh, communities like San Dimas where they're most, they mainly built out it's difficult to apply these type of developments so that's mainly one of the reasons why we haven't seen much activity with that being said um, staff to intends to propose an ordinance that would still apply some limitations to these uh, developments but again only apply them to one of the units um, the additional options that we brought back before you is uh, relate to unit size, um, height, and affordability. So the law, it states that units have to be 800 square feet. It doesn't state that we, a maximum or that we can, um, it doesn't clearly state that we can actually limit these, but it just states it has to be at least 800 square feet. So our proposal is that the second unit be limited to 800 square feet and provide some incentives that allows additional floor area. Um, we would allow a uh, thousand square foot unit if they were to propose a one car garage. The one car garage uh, would not count towards the unit's floor area and would have to comply with the existing setbacks. That's one option. Another option is if we would grant additional floor area if they were to make the unit affordable. Um, we propose 1,200 square feet because it's, it's unlikely that someone's going to build uh, an affordable unit only if they get an additional 200 square feet. So we added another 400, kicking it up to 1,200 square feet. And um, if someone wants to do an affordable unit, they would make, make it as big as 1,200 square feet. That would be the second option in terms of floor area. For height and stories, again, we would want to limit it to one story in height. Um, some of the options that are before you is if a lot would be at least 150 feet in depth, then we would allow a two-story unit. And what this um, tries to achieve is those deeper lots, you can space the units so you kind of avoid the overcrowding. And furthermore, if you were to require that the unit be located in the rear one third of the parcel, it may address some of the privacy concerns that were raised last time when we brought this before the council. In addition, I think last time we were here, the council suggested that maybe some properties that are adjacent to uh, like a wash or a channel, maybe they can have a two story house in the back. Um, we looked at that as well. There are some properties that abut to the wash um, in North San Dimas, I mean, towards the north of the town, and those can be applied to that. Um, we also looked at if we're going to do it to that, maybe other non sensitive uses like commercial properties or multifamily properties that are at the rear, those parcels could have a two story unit as well. So there's some options there as well. And lastly, um, from an affordability uh, a standpoint, we can require that the units be affordable. Um, just straight out affordable and not tied to any type of incentive, just require that the second unit be uh, affordable. This would be more towards the more restrictive options. So the three options that we have is, the first one is the least restrictive. Under this one, there is no limitations. They can build both units per our existing single family standards. On a typical lot, uh, it's 35% maximum lot coverage, and I think there's an example in your staff report for a 7,000 square foot lot, um, if they were to max out the, the lot coverage, it's 35%. Each, each unit would be about 20, just a little over 2,400 2500 square feet, and combined close to 5,000 square feet of floor area on the property. That would be option one. Under option two, which is more restrictive, and again, these, uh, we would apply incentives, but only applicable to the second unit, we can include any of the proposed developments that we've discussed tonight. Uh, a mixture of, of any of the standards can be included here, and thus, um, again, limiting the second unit um, only. And the third option would be the most restrictive. This would not provide any incentives. It would limit the second unit to 800 square feet and one story in height. And to take it one step further, we can even require that the second unit be affordable. So that would be the most restrictive option that we have before you. Um, that concludes staff's presentation. Happy to answer any questions. At this point, we are seeking direction from the council um, in terms of these optional uh, development incentives so we can include into an ordinance that will be presented to the Planning Commission and subsequently to the City Council. Are there any questions of Mr. Tarico? I know we don't have a large sample size, but of the four uh, applicants, can you talk a little bit about their use cases and why they want this, why they want to take advantage of this? What, what, are, their, what are their reasons? What are, they, what are they hoping to do? So of the four that we have, see um i think there's one the that has they're splitting it 
into two parcels and they want to build two units on each. So it's sort of the max of what they could do. Yes, so again, there's five applications and one of them, I'll just take that out of the equation because that one, they qualify, they, they process their project under a regular uh, process. They just applied, they switched it on SP9 because they wanted to get out of doing offsite improvements, which is one of the things that if it's an SP9 project, in addition to streamlining it, we can't require offsite improvements or dedication. So they switched it mainly for that reason. So there's really no, um, I, I would say even though it's an SP9 project, doesn't really qualify here. But of the other four, um, two are being split and creating two units on each of the lots. Um, one is actually, um, they're splitting the lot and they're keeping and remodeling the existing unit and building one unit on the second lot. And then the fourth one, all they're doing at this point is just splitting the lot this time. They're not proposing in development. Uh, it's a large lot, um, and they're splitting it uh, to create two parcels and sell both of them off. And these are with existing, all of them have existing homes right now on the lot. Yes, that's okay, correct. Great. Yes. Do we know what, their, what the reason is for wanting to build a second house? Is it just to like, get rental income? Is it, do, we have any, do you have any sense? We didn't get into any details with the applicants, but our sense is that a majority of them, they just want a additional, um, either for family members or as rental income. And the, the ones that are splitting the lot, they actually will be selling that second lot. So uh, for them, they're looking at it from like a, a developer standpoint where they can you know, still keep their property, their home, but split it off and make some money by selling off the second lot. I see. Can we go back to the slide with the, the, um, the, the options? Sorry. There we go. So in relation to these options, um, I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around, maybe it's just something that I missed, um, the uh, single story versus two story and how that weighs into uh, on uh, page 146 of our packet. Uh, and the header potential height option. It says that the um, commission agreed with uh, one story in height unless they provide a two car garage. So the way I kind of read that is if you were to build a ADU on top of your existing two car garage, so it maintains the, the parking of two cars in the garage itself, then that would be permitted because it's uh, keeping the parking and it's in an, it, adhering to existing setbacks and lot coverage. Am I reading that right? Yes, to an extent. That was one of the options that was presented the first time we were here was um, at that point, we're actually being a little more restrictive and uh, allowing a two-story unit if they build a two-car garage under these, uh, what's presented tonight, it's only a one-car garage, but uh, that, that scenario there, yes, it would be a two-car garage and the unit would be built, majority of the unit would be built on top. So in relation to these three options, would that be falling under like option two? It would be option two. Option two is the one that provides incentives okay. uh, and is the uh, more restrictive, uh, but also also uh, under option one, they could develop a two-story unit without any restrictions because right. the current code allows it. And then in option three, it would just be straight one story. They wouldn't be able to, uh, to build a second story on top of a garage. Correct, for the second unit only. Okay. Great, Ryan. I don't have any questions, but before we deliberate, I do have a comment. Okay, I, I had a question just uh, on that, just because it's listed in the option three, the most restrictive at the end of the presentation, and in the packet, it's on 128 and 129. Uh, is that, it says, it says it's uh, likely not to be a violation of SB9 law, or less likely, um, and is that because we're keeping the 35% lot coverage and limiting, and is that the only limitation besides a single story? So what we're proposing, and again, this is based on the recommendation from the city attorney's office, and again, this is on you. Uh, we don't know exactly 100% how ACD is gonna respond, but uh, our, our thoughts that are that right now, our single family zone allows the development of one unit per our existing standards. If we, tr if we create a new ordinance that applies to SB9, we still will allow the development of one unit per our existing standards, thus not being more restrictive. We're allowing that unit to be developed per our standards and then apply whichever, whatever limitations you may choose to to the second unit. So that, that's why we believe that HCD will not see that as a violation of the law. Okay. Now, what about um, 
larger lots, because we had talked about, you and I had talked about um, putting a second unit on a lot, and that's a right that people can, is that SB9 or is that another um, law that allows you to put that second unit on the existing lot without a lot split? SB9. Yeah, there's, SB9. There's, there's two aspects. There's a lot split and then there's a two unit development that allows existing single family parcels to develop uh, two units on their property, actually up to four units on the property, two regular units, an ADU and a junior ADU. Okay. So let, let's say somebody is just wants to build a larger than 800 square, they would like to anyway, and they, they've got like a large lot, say it's over 10,000 square feet for the lot. So your lot's getting a little bit bigger. Um, what do you think about allowing a larger than, uh, like adding that as, it's not necessarily an incentive, it's just an additional uh, something that people can do because they happen to have a larger piece of property. And uh, having, you know, having whatever restrictions on it, say single story, you know, you can go up to 35 lot percent, uh, maybe with some kind of max, whether it's 12, 13, 1400 square feet. Yes, we can definitely do that, include that. We can include that as a, it's an object, objective standard that we can include. So um, when we were looking at the whole lot size and uh, uh, we ended up with the lot depth, the reason we didn't further uh, study the lot size is because the average lot, the average lot in San Dimas is you're gonna get seven, between seven and 10,000 square feet. It's, you are gonna have some of these larger lots, but majority are smaller. So um, that's why we applied uh, the depth instead of the, the, the overall size of the area of the lot. But in certain cases where we have these larger lots, that could work. It, we can create like a sliding scale. And whether that it's a 10,000 square foot lot or a 15,000 square foot lot, uh, if, if, they, if they end up uh, the, with a newly created lot that has that or an existing lot, then potentially they can build that second unit up to maybe 1,500 square feet uh, 1,600 square feet uh, if we limit it to one story in height, like you were saying. And the reason I ask that question is because the it, uh, being more restrictive has its appeal, um, but on the other hand, it, if it's like a blanket 800 square feet, foot max, um, on some properties, a larger house would, would not have the kind of effect that like an 800 square foot or 1,000 square foot house might have in a, on a smaller lot like in the town core. That's correct. Yeah, as an example, one of the, the properties that, that submitted an SB9 uh, application on Valley Center, it's a large lot. And so if they were to develop, develop that for SB9, you really wouldn't feel much of the impact because of the size of the lot. So um, under those lots, it's an, it was an 18, it's an 18,000 square foot parcel and they're splitting it in two. So ending up with 9,000 square foot lots. So you really wouldn't see that as a negative impact on that one, so. Okay, good. Uh, one last question just, or asking maybe staff's thinking on this. You mentioned that uh, possibly allowing two stories on lots that are 150 feet deep but you know a lot of the houses you or lots you mentioned and you're talking about the town core lots a lot of them are only 50 feet wide and so that doesn't necessarily lessen the impact or, or do you think it lessens the impact of a two-story house being on a narrow lot like that well, I think the just, just because it's deep. Yeah, that, and then that was mainly it, it's because we can require that, that they place the unit towards the rear one third of the property, <gasps> thus keeping it away from the the primary units in the front and potentially open space areas in the back as well. Okay. All right. Any uh, any other co comments or questions? Is there a um, understanding as we talked about this matter last time, um, and we were concerned about this influx of applications and you know the crystal ball is there any time crunch to this at this moment there is no urgency um i think the ultimate goal is to uh draft an ordinance that we have in our books that you know allows applicants residents to follow but there is no urgency like i mentioned earlier there was in in the beginning some some concern that um these projects were going to be a proliferation of these projects and potentially impact single family neighborhoods but that hasn't been the case and it hasn't been the case for adjacent cities as well this is um a significant decision for the city uh, and i would hope the council would entertain a motion to continue this item so that we can take it up and have deliberation when the entire council can be present I think uh, that's something that we should uh, definitely look at. Uh, I know the 
you know, the, the mayor has spoken uh, in many different meetings about uh, his preferences on this, and uh, and I definitely value his opinion, and uh, and I think he would be uh, a great addition to the conversation if we were to, to postpone it. Is that a second? I am not. It, so did you make a motion, right? I did. <laughs> so Mr. Vienna made, and wait, did I hear a second? I'll second it. <laughs> okay, so I heard a motion to continue this item to a date uncertain, or you want to go to uh, date to be determined as uh, perhaps check in with the mayor and uh, when we can all be present um, I, I know right now that the first meeting that all council members will be present will most likely be the second meeting in May since variance council members have conflicts that take them away from the meetings the mayor today others for the rest of the meetings did you say the second meeting in May that would be the earliest that we have all five council well, members here. will that be a budget planning meeting um, unfortunately, with the budget, we, we had the internal discussions. Um, we need to have a preliminary budget coming forth earlier than that. And so that will be happening. We're trying to schedule that. And so we will not have the full council. But for the final budget and the deliberations, yes, we need the whole council there. We do. And then so now we're into June um, because I would agree with um, other council members that we need, need the full council. Mem council. So, it's, so let's make it a date date uncertain knowing that we still want to do it but uh, so the motion is to continue this to a date uncertain when all council members can be present physically eric seconded that any have, comment I, or discussion i, I have on one question so the ordinance if we were to enact it at this meeting or a future meeting would apply to future applications not those already in process or is it retroactive as well it would be for once we so we would have to go back to obviously generate the ordinance, then we'd present that to Planning Commission, City Council, have a first, second reading, and 30 days after that, it would become in effect. Um, for future. For future. Okay, got it. So right now, I think the, the reason why I asked that question is just playing off applications that are coming in, how many of those do we want whatever we decide to apply to? Five over the course of a year, I think, is what you had said, and no rush in other cities does not. A little over like a year, yeah. A pressing issue, um, and if we are also hearing that those that have come in don't seem to have any effect, you know, taking these large, humongous lots, I, I don't even. Do we even need to really set a date for this? I mean, we just maybe approach it when there seems to be a need. It's going to be a date uncertain, yeah. And um, so staff will determine that in conjunction yeah. of when the council will all be here. So there isn't a time limit, time crunch per se, but we, for all applications that come in now, we'd have to go by the state guidelines. Correct. And we would have to go with our current code for both lots, 35%, two story uh, height limits, et cetera, so. Which is basically option one, isn't it? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yes. Right. So, yes. So that's, I want to make sure that's it, yes. Uh, Right, the council is not saying at this point yeah. that we don't want to do anything. And Sooner just... than September. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right, we have a motion on the table. I think it's understood what the direction is. Um, all in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Uh, the motion carries four yes, zero no, and one member absent, the mayor. And that concludes other business. So let's see, the next thing we're gonna go on to is we're now into the second period of oral communications. Same rules apply. Is there anybody in the audience who wants to speak to the council at this time? I don't see anybody coming up. So we're gonna move on to staff and city council reports. First up is the manager, Mr. Constantine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two updates on storm damage, uh, sand, first San Dimas Loop, uh, northbound San Dimas Avenue still remains closed north of Calle Solana. Staff continues to monitor and assess the condition and is working with consultants to provide repair recommendations for that uh, segment of what is public property. Uh, we're, we have submitted our damage assessments to our regional emergency response body and so it will be a waiting game to determine whether they will they will eventually be accepted and potentially get some recovery from the state for a portion of what would be the cost. Uh, we have an engineer, a geotechnical engineer, 
uh, assessing and going to give us a more detailed report on that. And so as we find more information that's relevant for the council, I'll, I'll inform you and it may be through one of my updates. Um, a second one on Canterbury Lane. This is a private property uh, hillside slide. Uh, there has been significant damage due to the storms uh, which have compromised the hillside. Currently there are no homes that are threatened, but city staff, the HOA who is responsible for that segment of the property and our geotechnical engineer have been out to inspect the property. Um, I provided a photograph to you. It's a you got to when you zoom in and you realize that those little specks are actually people and how large the depth of the drop is. It's it's pretty tremendous. It's actually worse in terms of the repair and damage than ours on the public property. Uh, and so the HOA has placed warning signs. Uh, those property ends up being on the backside of private property. So there's been warning signs placed. So if anybody kind of makes their way to that direction, they know, hey, there's a drop off that is greater than 35 feet that occurs uh, in that location. And so we're, we're still in the early stages of uh, assessing that. We've added that to our damage assessment. It's part of the reason why we did the second disaster proclamation that you approved today and um, uh, ratified my proclamation uh, to ensure that we can keep prod keep damage push forward and potentially seek recovery and even though this is a private property damage we submitted that also in terms of the gold line update on Benita cataract the contractor is installing the final improvements to get this intersection to its final configuration so I think we're getting to the end of the road in terms of what this intersection will look like on Thursday March 30th um, from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., the contractor will close eastbound Bonita Avenue at Cataract for one day to do the final paving for the eastbound lanes. Um, Cataract Avenue will remain closed at Bonita Avenue. And then the following day, the 31st, from 7 to 11, the contractor will close the westbound Bonita Avenue at Cataract for a day to do the final paving on the westbound lane. And so that hopefully gets us to almost completely finished. Uh, the last item, uh, I think all of us are very well aware of the tragedy that unfolded in Nashville, Tennessee with the death of six individuals, three students and three staff uh, in Nashville. Uh, the president issued uh, a, a proclamation honoring the victims. It's a very somber ac event to occur. Uh, I want to recognize that the Los Angeles Sher County Sheriff's Office um, has been doing the rotations to all our local schools, conducting active shooter training, which uh, is been something that is a risk in an environment such as a school. So I think the fact that we're working with the school district, ensuring they're preparing and they're training, uh, I hope we never have to face this event in our community. But I think if it does occur, the training and the preparation and the proper response from all our agencies is crucial. And I ask that when we close the meeting, we close it in honor of uh, those who had died in Nashville, Tennessee. With that, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Um, Mr. City Attorney, is there anything? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I need to state for the record under the Brown Act that our first closed session item tonight, an anticipated litigation item, is regarding the City Council's adoption of Resolution 2016-19 regarding changes to the Walnut Creek Habitat and Open Space Project. And I have nothing further than that. Okay, thank you. Um, members of the City Council, first of all, re any council members report on meetings attended at the expense of the City of San Dimas? None of those this time. We'll go on to City Council requests for future items, updates, and general comments. Eric Nakano, we're going to start over at your end. Uh, I will be brief. I have just a few quick things. I first want to wish uh, Mayor Bedar a speedy recovery. Uh, in, I know he's not with us physically, but I'm sure he's watching on YouTube and uh, very engaged with the discussions we're having. So we miss you, Mr. Mayor, and we, well, we, we hope we wish you a speedy recovery, and we look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Um, the second item I wanted to uh, bring up is March. As we approach the end of March, 
uh, March. I know that we've commemorated March already, uh, but there are a couple of other items that I want to just highlight because I think they're important. Number one, it's a Women's History Month. Uh, to celebrate all the achievements of women in our country who've done a lot to move our country forward. So I salute all the women past and present who've made our country a better place uh, and the people here at city government who have done so much to ensure that we live in the best town we can possibly live in. The other um, uh, commemoration is March is also colorectal cancer month. Uh, as many of you know, my mom passed away from colorectal cancer a few years ago. Uh, and because of my elevated family history, I get um, uh, colonoscopies every two years. In fact, I got one early this year. It's painless. Colon cancer is very easily be tr very easily treatable if you catch it at stage one, stage two. It gets much more difficult once it hits stage three and stage four, which is where we caught it with my mom. Um, and so I would encourage everybody, especially if you are under the age of 45, uh, that is where we've seen the largest rise. Uh, what I do in my spare time is I'm in a, a bunch of cancer groups and help advise younger people on their treatment options. And it's really, really difficult to see um, people in their 20s and in their 30s face a diagnosis of this. Uh, recently, uh, there was someone age nine who passed away from colon cancer. Uh, and so I would just ask that, think about it. If you, if you feel like you have any symptoms or you just want to go in, you, you should definitely get checked out for that. It can make a world of difference and, um, and certainly uh, make sure that you are not following the path of others who were diagnosed too late. Um, the last thing I would say is I just want to pay a special tribute to our city attorney for being a new parent, showing up to all these meetings, um, very engaged and always guiding the city along with your excellent uh, opinions and wisdom. And so we really appreciate, we know that you could be at home with your, with your young child, but we're, we're so grateful that you're here and fulfilling your duty. And I just want to salute you for that. So with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Thank you, Eric Weber. Yeah, I guess we like you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, the only thing, I've got one thing, and that's that, uh, that this uh, Saturday before last, uh, I know we talked about the uh, Crime Survivors 5K event that was, uh, was happening in Bedelli Park uh, prior to it happening, before at our last meeting. Uh, I had a chance to attend that along with... Uh, uh, Council Member Vienna and uh, had a, a nice run. It was a beautiful day out, and uh, honestly, the the turnout um, was fantastic. I, th I think uh, I had to walk a 5K just to get from where I parked to the event, and then run a 5K. <laughs> so uh, you know, I, it was really great to see everybody out there, um, and uh, it was a really good event. So uh, you know, keep that in mind next year. Um, it, it's an uh, annual event, and it's always uh, here in Benelli Park locally. Thanks. Ryan Vienna. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, boy. Where to start? One, uh, obviously, uh, the Crime Survivors 5K event uh, Council Member Weber talked about was a good time. Sheriff Luna was there, as well as uh, Crime Survivors Organization, and so many others uh, attended that event. So uh, it was very beautiful, uh, honoring the crime survivors, as well as... Uh, those that work to keep them safe, uh, representatives from all various offices, whether it was the DA's office or otherwise. Uh, shout out to our San Dimas Sheriff Station, our explorers, our volunteers. So many people were out there just helping make that happen. And uh, thank you to all of you guys, as well as uh, the Parks Bureau, who I know had a fun day with that too. On the same day, uh, and I ended up, I, I did not run uh, as Council Member Weber, but I did somehow end up walking the thing uh, and got a bib and all, so uh, that was not planned and I wore the wrong shoes, but needless to say, uh, it was a nice course uh, as it has been in the past. And, uh, you know, really thankful to the county, to Supervisor Barger for really maintaining Benelli uh, for the residents to enjoy keeping both the trails as well as the grounds in good condition for everybody. It's a wonderful piece of open space, uh, as well as the water levels, as you can imagine, are not low right now. And so uh, it's definitely a good time to check it out and some very awesome photography opportunities with the uh, mountains and the foothills in the background. 
Uh, since our last meeting, I had the opportunity to attend the Public Safety Commission meeting. Um, there's a lot of good things being discussed. If you are someone who is interested in public safety, I highly encourage you to visit the city's website and attend those meetings. There is a lot of very valuable information that is shared uh, at those meetings uh, and a lot of things that people bring forward that the Commission and the Sheriff's Department and the city staff work together on. With that said, I'm hoping uh, the council or at least one other member will indulge me in referring a question to the Public Safety Commission to be examined and report back. Uh, I would like to refer a question or a task to the Public Safety Commission to examine public safety concerns around our mobile home parks. Uh, I'd like staff to work with the Sheriff's Department uh, and have that item brought to the Public Safety Commission uh, as well as any other outreach that needs to be done so that the Public Safety Commission could report back to the Council and advise the Council on what public safety concerns seniors residing in our mobile home parks have and what is the data around that uh, that looks at both quality of life issues as well as perhaps part one, part two crimes uh, over a period of, let's say, the last five years. I would support that. Thank you. Uh, I also have one other question. I'd like to refer to the Senior Citizen Commission. Uh, the Senior Citizen Commission, as some know, is tasked with looking at challenges in our community. And I think sustainable senior living is one of them. Um, I would like the Senior Citizen Commission the question to be posed to them as it relates to our mobile home parks and aging seniors is what do they envision uh, is a sustainable path for seniors in our community and what role do mobile home parks play in that? I don't know if anyone else is interested in that. I would support that one too. All right. N Thank now you. That's, that's your limit though tonight. We've got a couple yeah. other things, yeah, okay. uh, well, let's Mr. See. Mayor Pro Tem. <laughs> uh, also, um, and this is just a comment for staff, I'd really like uh, staff to work with the Charter Oak Mole Home Estates to be able to look into some of the concerns that are being raised uh, by the citizens. Um, it, you know, I'd love to say we're making progress on some of those things, but when members of the community continue to come and uh, raise their concerns to the council, um, I don't know based off of some of the concerns that I've heard that some of those things are being addressed and, and perhaps they are. Um, and if there needs to be a meeting uh, with uh, the management and I or, or another member of council, so be it. Um, but I'd like to get some clarity on some of the concerns. If staff, uh, if staff's looked into it, great. Uh, then I'd like to meet with the manager if staff has not or wants to conduct further outreach, then I'll let staff do what they need to do. Let me just speak to that last one because uh, I had another request from a council member to reach out directly to the manager. Yeah, He's open to speaking directly to any council member regarding the matters. Um, our agreement with the property manager has a very articulated process that folks have to follow. Uh, they haven't necessarily gotten to the end of that process that includes a decision by a hearing officer on the matter that's before them. But I know that they have been working on the billing issue and a number of other pieces, and there's some reasonings why it's longer, taking a little bit longer than what we all would be con you know, happy with. But my understanding is they are making progress. Okay. So something, w and perhaps an email update to council would be great, just an update on what measures have been taken or at least have been done to be able to address some of the concerns specifically related to billing, specifically related to receipt issuance to uh, folks that are that are living there uh, who are maybe not being provided a receipt. Um, those are things that I, I would be curious about. I, I will have staff to ask the property manager to prepare an update as to where they are with those concerns. Great, thank you. And then, um, Oh boy, uh, you know, our youth are critically important because they're the future. And when I hear things like, um, and I'm sure 
my colleagues all received spirited calls from Little League uh, in the days leading up to this meeting. Um, I am concerned regarding both uh, enforcement of municipal code uh, as well as process. Uh, so I'd like to ask the city to take some steps and I do know that there were some social media posts that uh, talked about you know, having your dogs on a leash and so forth. Um, but I'd really like staff um, to either up the game or request to the sheriff's department that we do some more patrol checks during little league uh, practice and games um, to be able to mitigate this problem. Uh, those fields, uh, I understand, are little league utilizes them. Uh, and I think there's a balancing act there between public's right to access the park coupled with and the hours of usage for Little League against uh, someone's right to be able to be in that public space and utilize it for recreation. But the city does have ordinances related to dogs on leash in the park and a safety concern is a safety concern. No, I think staff fully agrees with you and uh, we have very recently provided that request from the sheriff's office for extra patrol. Uh, we are going to be sitting down with members of the Little League to talk further about their recommendations. We've done uh, recent social media posts about regulations pertaining to your dogs must be on leash and you can be cited if they're not. And, and we're working on larger signage because we have signage, it's just not large enough so that somebody with a dog could see that you shouldn't be in there with a dog off leash. And so if there's anything else we identify, absolutely, uh, we're, we're aligned in terms of ensuring the safety of our residents. All right, and then last uh, two things. One is uh, this Saturday, oh, I almost forgot. I also wanted to applaud Parks and Recreation. I stopped by the City Olympics right after Crime Survivors. I was there for a while. It was pretty rad. A lot of uh, youth were participating in that at the Splex. Uh, again, like Eric, uh, Councilmember Weber said, it was a hike to get there. Parking was a little challenging, but uh, the event was well attended. The stands were full, and uh, it was cool even seeing some of our city staff had uh, uh, family that were participating in that event, so that was really awesome. Saturday, uh, speaking of Parks and Rec, uh, is the Easter event, uh, so that should be at both um, Via Verde Park and here at Civic Center. If anybody wants to attend, that's always a good event. Uh, I hope you are there at the beginning. You can refer to the city's social media. I think it starts at 10, is that right? And you better not be there, as the mayor would say, a minute late because the Easter egg hunt is over as quick as it starts. So, um, you know, it's, <laughs> things go fast. Um, and lastly, um, and, and Via Verde Park, too. I think I mentioned that. So Via Verde Park and Civic Center both start at 10, and um, both those events should be good. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be able to attend. Um, Council Member Weber uh, and I and our other capacities will be uh, participating uh, at the Baker to Vegas uh, event, which is a law enforcement race. Uh, I'm going to be rooting for the San Dimas Sheriff Station team. Uh, and uh, hope that the team, uh, Walnut San Dimas team, does good. And uh, I'm also going to be rooting for my, my workplace team uh, where I'm assigned. And uh, hopefully I'll catch up with Council Member Weber. But I hope everyone hydrates and does well and our teams do well. And thank all the volunteers, all of the folks that donate to help make that event possible and participate. And lastly, um, well, I won't be at, I, there's a good chance I won't be at the next city council meeting, so I'll, I'll talk to the city manager uh, if I need to remote in, um, depending on the time change, maybe we'll figure that out um, under the old Brown Act uh, provisions. And uh, last thing, I know the mayor's at home watching, miss you, hope you get better, and uh, hope to see you soon, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, um, I have the I have the requests in the second council members. I don't have a second council member on the Charter Oaks property, so I just want to, for the record, get that. Oh, is anyone? That's fine. No. Yeah. You put me down. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you on that. Um, just a couple last minute things here. Uh, first of all, the downtown specific plan is coming along. And tomorrow night, uh, that's Wednesday, uh, March 29th, 
at 6 p.m. in the Senior Center. There's going to be workshop number four. I don't know a lot of details, but it sounds from the flyer and talking to staff that we're going to actually see a lot of what has been developed by the consultant and staff and get some reaction and some more input from um, the public. Those workshops have been pretty well attended, but uh, it does not hurt to get the word out some more. It's tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. Be there, and uh, that impacts the, the town pretty much, uh, what, what's going to be happening in the downtown specific plan. Um, the other thing is that, um, besides everything that others mentioned, is that we do um, have a parking, an overnight parking enforcement moratorium going into effect uh, for spring break. Now, spring break is a little different for a lot of different uh, schools and places, but ours begins on Saturday, April 1st, so that's next, not this coming Saturday. No, that is this coming Saturday. I need to correct the update I provided you. It went into effect in, at the Saturday in March and goes through all the way to April, uh, April 2nd. Okay, so the original post was correct. The correction was... Correct. So and so now we're back to the... Uh, can you say those dates again, Chris? Uh, March 25th? Uh, or th No, I said March 25th. It's the weekend of the March 25th through April 2nd. The, the last weekend. So it's in effect right now? Correct. Okay, got it. Okay, that aligns with the spring breaks that I know about. It's just the one, it's just the one week? Okay. All right, so we, we got two different pieces of information we put out. Um, it's, it, is, it does start Friday night and goes through the 2nd, correct? April 2nd. Yes, so those dates. Okay. We will make sure the website properly okay. reflects what the moratorium is. It's like just forget everything I just said, and here's the actual dates. Um, so Saturday, April 1st at 2 a.m., that's Friday night, okay, is when we, we are not going to be enforcing the parking, overnight parking restrictions. And that goes all the way through Sunday morning. April 9th, but starting on Monday, April 10th at 2 o'clock in the morning, you either need a permit or don't put your car on the street. And then you're, uh, you're in jeopardy of a ticket. So, uh, so that's that. Um, the uh, only other thing was, um, uh, yeah, Emmett's not here today. Um, I'm appreciative to be able to stand in for him. Thanks, and um, I hope we did a good job. I talked to him yesterday. He's He's hanging in there, and he'll be back as soon as he possibly can, I, 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 knowing Emmett. Um, and with that, we have a uh, closed session we're going to be going into in the City Council Conference Room. We've got the anticipated litigation that Jeff talked about. And then are we also going to be talking with real property negotiators? Uh, yes, but I want to make one correction. Uh, okay. The City Attorney, Jeff Malawi, will be attending, not Michael Houston, the Assistant City Attorney. That's a carryover from... Got it. Okay, meeting. that's in the agenda packet. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and with oh, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, just before, I'd like to move that uh, the mayor's absence uh, be excused for today. Hmm. I'll second. Thank you. <laughs> He's excused. We uh, we actually need to vote on that. Do we have to vote on? It? Okay. So all in favor of excusing the mayor, say aye. 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 Anybody don't want to excuse him, say no. I, what does it mean exactly? <laughs> I don't know what that means it's just if you if you miss a certain number of meetings in a row you're under the law you can actually be removed from Got council okay. automatically yep. unless they're excused so that would be the purpose of it Th thank you for bringing that up ryan appreciate that all right then we will be adjourning this what meeting I, in honor of the victims of the shooting in nashville we are adjourned <laughs>